This is the Go Maluku Podcast. All right, man. All right, Roberto, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we just had a, a bit of a laugh in, 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 in the pre, um, um, yeah, what is it? Pre-podcast, a little, little bit of talk, but thank you so much for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I appreciate it and look forward to our chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, and I'm, I have to say, like, I'm, I'm sorry for for because um, we we tried to schedule it uh, uh, before a couple of times, but then um, yeah, obviously COVID nineteen and 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 my, I have a I have a job as well, so uh, suddenly my my boss um, like reshuffled my schedule and I had to cancel on on Roberto. Um, sometimes even like oh, last time was the last minute, like one hour before. Like, I was like, ah oh, shit, now I have to send a, this message to Roberto who was like all getting getting ready to to go into the go into the conversation um so I hope I didn't um ruin your day that um last week no no I understand I understand busy so <laughs> appreciate it man appreciate well, uh, it there's no no worries on that I'm just happy that we can find some time uh, to do this and... yeah I when I um I've been doing this podcast for a while and actually when, when, when we started talking, cause we talked, we talked um, like, um, like a couple of weeks ago because we're doing projects together, together with the uh, uh, World Wildlife WWF. Sorry. And um, as, then I realized like, holy shit, why haven't I, um, yeah. Why haven't I invited um roberto yet for 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 the podcast so i was like yeah just just um let's have this conversation before we um as soon as possible because yeah i don't know like i just like talking to you man Uh, you you are a um a person that's very well known a lot of people recognize you um i i i recall what was it I hope I hope that's uh it's un- a good thing. It's it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> Could be taken a whole nother way. <laughs> <laughs> um no, it is I assure you it is it is a it is in a good way. Right. Uh because uh, well, the arrows right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh my god, what is he what is this guy going to go, uh, going to talk about right now? No, it was you were wrecking. There was this guy. There was this uh, guy from the UN security in New York, and oh. while we're at Cop and Bond, I believe yeah. he recognized you. I'm mean, like, yeah, like that never happens to me or or anybody else, but it, it only happens to you. So you're you're you're, you're a familiar guy around the UN grounds, you know, yeah. and also and I like I and and I don't I think you're you're doing a good thing when UN security recognizes you in in a, in a positive way. <laughs> Stop that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, you know, I've been um, kind of engaging the UN system since the early 90s. So being here in New York in that time, you know, I've been able to to meet folks who have been part of the system and, you know, like a I, I like to talk to to people, <laughs> doesn't matter who they are in the system. So when you see people regularly, I think it's always good to you know to speak to people to you know introduce yourself, especially when you see them more regularly. And and over the years, yeah, the you know people forget that the UN is this whole system, right? Where you know you have the the face of the agencies and the governments, but then there's also other people who make things happen at the UN, either behind the scenes, like, you know, the technical crews that, that move the microphones and the, the security officers, as, as you said, that we have to work with uh, on occasion, especially if we're doing programming around events, you always have to engage with your insecurity. So, you know, being in a few of those meetings over the years, right, um, you, you get to know people and see people and, you know, learn a little bit about them and what they're interested in and what what's on their mind i think it's interesting to also to just hear with you know what other people are thinking about what's going on in in, in that place right that mm-hmm. place that has such a you know reputation on on many levels and so yeah so um i always enjoy when we're somewhere else and there's a you security hey i know you from new york or i know you from here 
It happened to me in Samoa too when we were in the small island developing wow. stage meeting. There was some some guys there that 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 recognized me and we had a we had a nice chat and uh, it was good. But it's yeah, it's that's always always fun and it's nice when people you know think about you in a good way. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. Like yeah. when um when when that happened uh because I think I remember the both of us were walking through security in Bonn and this guy recognized you. Uh, there's a security officer and, officer and, and a very, very friendly guy, you know, like, like and he, he definitely knew you from New York. The first thing that went through my mind was, all right, if you are here, who's protecting, who, who's, who, who's providing security at the, at the UN in New York, you know, if everyone, because it's, it's almost like in, in UN summits, whether it's Samoa or Samoa or in, in, in Bonn or uh, Madrid or, or maybe in Glasgow in a, in a, um, in a couple of months. Um, like they, they gathered all these, these experienced um, U.S. security officers from New York, Geneva, because I re also recognize some from Geneva, um, Nairobi, Vienna. And I'm like, well, if you guys are here, who's who's in New York? Who's in who's in Geneva? Like I said, like, I don't know, local security is, is, a, is are they protecting you? And what's what's going on? It's always yeah, up. Were Shifts. They work them in shifts. They they get appointments like uh, other agency folks, and then they you know get special special appointments for that time. And you know the shift is moved around. And right, yeah, uh, yeah. That's 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 what 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 I what I wondered. Um, but yeah, it, it's um, I, th I think it's also a testament that to to the person that you are. Um, and like a lot of people know you, recognize you in a good way. Um, if people are watching, listening, like, <laughs> thank you. Um, it is always in a good way. Um, like to take us back to, um, you know, like, like what got you into the movement? Um, what, um, always, I'm always fascinated by the origin story of, of people, like why they got, they got to do what they do, uh, whether it's, Inside a movement or outside a movement, um, what was the experience that 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 made you want to go like, all right, let's let's do this UN thing? Can you remember that? Hmm. You know, I'm not as young as I used to be, but yeah, I'll think, <laughs> I'll think on this. Um, yeah, no, I I, I remember vividly um, what happened. Um, you know, I I come from uh, the Taino people indigenous people of the Caribbean islands, in particular, my family lineage, the paternal and maternal side come from the island of Boriquen, which uh, people know today as Puerto Rico. And um, I was living in New York. And because I, I, you know, kind of aware of my heritage and, and just uh, making those connections with other indigenous peoples in New York, either through festivals or, or powwows, uh, what they have uh, here in this area um, that are hosted by uh, local indigenous uh, com people's communities or organizations, uh, cultural organizations. Anyway, I, I, I had a little bit of, of uh, you know, connection with the, with the local community. Uh, myself, coming from a you know, an artist background, uh, you know, like music and culture and arts and stuff, stuff like that. And uh, anyway, there was uh, some Taino people uh, who were saying, who let me know uh, that there was going to be some meetings happening at the UN. Mm -hmm. And this was in advance of the International Year of the World's Indigenous Peoples. And so... Uh, they said, look, we, we can't afford to be flying back and forth, you know, for these meetings. And, um, you know, would you be interested in going to the meetings and just kind of letting us know what's happening? You know? And I said, well, I don't really know anything about the UN. I, I, I didn't mm -hmm. at that time. Um, but I said, or, or, you know, all right. I mean, sounds interesting. I'll, I'll go. So I started to go and, and started to become involved like that. And, and uh, there were some uh, uh, elders from the nearby communities and, and leaders at, at that time who were involved in native rights movement. And I'm talking about like American Indian movement, 
mm. early on that you know the active during the 70s and and uh you know during the power movements black power red power and, and that and so i started to meet some of these folks and and uh, some of them took a liking to me and and invited me to other uh gatherings or or um ceremonies that that were going on hey why don't you come you're, you're, you're a young guy you know why don't you come to this ceremony and and um, you know hang out with us for a bit and so i started to make contacts like that but it was really initiated by um a need from my own community uh with regard to that that planning for the international year of the world's indigenous peoples and that was like um you know really in new york the the first the first big event that was going on for indigenous peoples this precedes the the permanent forum and so there was a lot of mobilization locally and so i was part of that local mobilization and that and that's where it began and then i just kept going but people kept asking me to do things and um i i didn't realize at that at that time that you could really say no Right, to things and so I just was like yes to everything and and kind of rearranged at at a point I I rearranged my my life around around being a part of that the movement right and and uh, you know with jobs you know how it is you 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 have a, a job yourself and and how you arrange things to to be a part of you know whether it's a, a, an international meeting or or something else another project that you're working on you try to to work that out. And so I did the same, uh, during that time. And, and, you know, was, and here we are, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some, some years later and, and, uh, still, still around. Now, <clears throat> how did it, um, first, first time going to, in, into the UN, um, do you feel that, that, um, you had enough capacities or, or, um, knowledge to uh, to do it no i i definitely didn't i had a lot of probably a lot of heart and passion mm. right about the issue because you know i i have i was discriminated against as as a kid just for you know, the color of my skin or people not knowing what i was or you know being confused for many other things mm. and um so um you know definitely i did not feel that i had the capacity but um, I resonated with a lot of things that um, that some of these more experienced leaders were sharing, and uh, I picked up on things pretty quick. And um, I think that early in early kind of foundation with the the spirituality aspect of it, you know, like being connected and being invited to ceremonies and and uh, getting to meet some some really. Uh, now legendary elders, mm -hmm. right, at least in the American Indian movement and, and beyond, right? Because, you know, even though we were in New York, uh, there was still an international uh, component, right, to what was going on with the indigenous people's movement. And, you know, people would come into town and, and we'd be introduced. And like I said, there was a lot of local activity because, you know, you're talking about a time period that was leading up to 1992, which mm. was, you know, the quincentennial of the arrival of Cristobal Colón to this side of the world. And, for, you know, that's Christopher Columbus. Mm. And uh, so there was a lot of activity uh, from indigenous peoples, at least in the Western Hemisphere, to, to highlight that. And even the international year itself, um, you know, there was some controversy because of that. It, as I understood it back then, and uh, I don't know if this is on the official record or not, but the first proposal around that time period was from Spain, and they wanted to have an international year of the discovery of the Americas, or right. And uh, yes, I saw, I see your <laughs> eyebrow go up, and, and probably you know many eyebrows will go up at, at, at yeah, but, um, yeah. So as you could imagine there was some outcry about that. And so not only from indigenous peoples, but also from uh, Caribbean nation states, mm. because many of these, these nation states have large and almost uh, large African descendant uh, populations now. Right. And, uh, you know, 
folks who are running the governments and they were like, well, wait a minute, you know, this is, uh, didn't Columbus initiate the transatlantic slave trade? I mean, I don't know if this is something we should be celebrating, right? Yeah. And, uh, and of course, indigenous peoples, you know, this marks a genocide for, for our peoples in this hemisphere, starting with the Taino uh, in those Caribbean islands where he landed. So there was that outcry and there was, uh, when I mentioned a lot of local activity, there was some very large um, demonstrations that were being planned across from the UN. Mm. Uh, because to highlight that and to highlight the situation of indigenous peoples. And so at that time, there was an organization, uh, there was a couple organizations that, that were kind of mobilizing around that. One was a, a group called the League of Indigenous Sovereign Nations, or LISTEN uh, for short. And the other one was 500 Years of uh, Resistance. And I think it was Resistance of Indigenous, Afro, and and, and popular resistance, something like that, but we just call it 500 years of resistance for sure. Mm. And so there was all this mobilization going on between indigenous peoples. And again, you know, I just kind of volunteered to do what I, I could. And, and I was feeling very um, happy to do that as it, 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 you know, while I, I, I understood and, and, and had a, had a um, semblance of, of who I was as, as a Taino person, you know, we, I was not really linked up with the community so deeply, right? And this was a, an opportunity to really link up with, with not only other Taino, but other indigenous peoples. And, and as I said, uh, you know, we were meeting some uh, really interesting, you know, now legendary people who were in the American Indian movement and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, who have been involved in, in, in mass organizing and through the 1970s, you know, through the power movements, right? And so it was, it was a, a bit exciting so i wanted to be a, a part of that and i think at the first big demonstration that was planned in 93 um you know i did i was doing like security by the stage right and and uh you know i was i wasn't really speaking at that time but mm. you know, i was listening and helping to organize and coordinate and carrying chairs and things like that and you know all, all the things that you need to do to get an event going and um so yeah, so that's how it started. But you know, to get back to your original question, I didn't feel adequate enough <laughs> when I started entering the UN. Uh, but you know, you learn if if you listen and and learn, you see what's going on. And people, I was fortunate that people saw something in in me. And there was that, um, you know, we didn't even call it mentorship at that time, but mm. it was like as I look back at it now, it was there was definitely mentorship going on. And uh, although we didn't use a lot of that, term, you know, that type of terminology that, that we're so used to using now, uh, but then, you know, we weren't, people just kind of took you under their wing and, and, you know, led you in the right direction and kind of threw you in the fire in, in, in some, in some uh, instances where you just had to remember what, what they said. And mm -hmm. if they weren't there, you know, just repeat what they were saying, basically, uh, because those were the points that, that needed to get out, right? So you know, you end up taking that role when, when, when they're, when that leadership is not around, they, they expect that and they expect reported facts and let them know what's going on. So that, that was all going on, but it was all leading up to that. And so that's why, uh, again, if, uh, just to wrap up on this, the, the compromise that I understood with, with, the, with the government of Spain was at that time was that, okay, so instead of doing the, international year of the world's indigenous peoples in 1992 that they would do it the following year 1993 so that it wouldn't bring you know so much attention on that subject right right uh, there and so it was it, the organizing started and, and that 1993 was there and, and folks came inside the un uh, for the first time, you had Hopi leader like Thomas Benyanka talking about the House of Micah, and, and uh, there was a huge storm out when they all, you know, came in, and you know, here these indigenous leaders are are speaking at the podium for the first time in the General Assembly, and you see all this lightning and, and dark storm clouds outside, and and it was it was interesting. It was interesting. Um, you um. First, first time going to the UN, you sound like you, well, like you said, you know, like you, know, you didn't didn't feel that you had, um, weren't prepared enough to do it, but you did 
pick up the ball and you, you and you ran with it, right? Um, is is that something that that a, a trait or a skill um, that you developed when you were young, uh, growing up as a Taino uh, Taino kid? Well, you know, I think um, again, uh, growing up as a Taino kid, that that's a pretty interesting statement because you know we were an urban family, mm. right? I wasn't growing up in a community. Um, you know, we, my mother was the first one to talk to me about my heritage and to tell me, you know, that we had this indigenous heritage and I could certainly see it on my father's side, uh, with my grandfather and, and, and other relatives and, you know, some of the things that they did and, and what, but, you know, as a kid, we really didn't see ourselves as, you know, the Taino people were the first indigenous peoples in the hemisphere to be called Indians, right? Mm. Uh, by, by Columbus and the Spaniards. But as kids, we didn't really see ourselves as Indians, right? Because the Indians that we knew were on TV, right? Like that was the context. And there was always uh, cowboy, you know, Western type themes, cowboys, right. movies, teepees. And, and so you didn't really have the, the understanding other than, boy, some of these folks look like us, right? But they don't dress like us. We don't, you know, we're not riding horses in, in, in that way. We're not living in teepees. We have an apartment in the Bronx or in Manhattan, in Spanish Harlem. And, and you know, aren't we just happy to be Puerto Ricans or, or Cubans or, or what have you? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as I, as I was growing up, you know, as I mentioned, I was confused for like native Hawaiian. I, I was asked many times as a kid, are you Cherokee or, or something along that, that line? And um, especially when I started getting out and going to work, like doing work and stuff, you know, that, that kind of thing would happen. You know, some kids, they were like, well, what are you? Are you know, you're not black. What do you, you know, what, what are you? Right. And, and so it was always like a weird type of thing. So when you say growing up as a Taino kid, yeah, there's a lot of context as an urban, uh, you know, indigenous person, right? Uh, you know, we could say at that time, uh, indigenous descendant, somebody of indigenous descent, right? And but beyond the family and the and the community, that that you knew through your family, you know, we were not really connected with the larger community, and so, you know, it was only later on, as I mentioned, as I started, you know, going out and and connecting with others that you know, realizing that there's this whole other community and um, being a part of that. So, you know, it's also that, that re re knowing for yourself as, as a kid and, and growing up. Um, but, you know, later on, as I started to really understand more about, about my ancestral culture and, you know, why we're in, in the condition that we are, why, you know, certain people say things about, mm -hmm. you know, Indians or Indios. And, um, you know, when you start to realize, you know, that, that people do make comments on based on the color of your skin or, or things of that nature, you know, I, I start to look at some of the things that I was attracted to or wanting to do that or wanting to do. And, um, you know, you, you start to make a connection, especially if, if you are connected or getting connected or, or reinvigorating that spiritual side of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that starts to really, you know, you start to kind of see those, those connections and why I was attracted to, you know, this when I was, when I was younger and, you know, maybe that's, that was the, you know, the pathway, the little openings, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we had. And so, um, as I, as uh, growing up in New York, you know, seeing other other natives and going to you know to powwows and things like that, and and going to the to the the booths that people have when when you go to those those events, um, and I would always be asked, hey, what tribe are you? And and I feel a little bit inadequate in that way, in in, in identity wise, and and that oh, you know, you wouldn't really know, you know, like my um, they're like, where are you from? And I'm tell, oh, so you're Taino, and I'd be like, what? You know, like who we are, you know? And so that's that really kind of drew me in and, mm -hmm. and widened my my scope because you know, the, certainly the schools were not uh, the educational system public schools were not um, assisting us in, in that way 
um, you know, we would go to school and then hear, um, okay, Columbus came to this side of the world in 1492. And then the next thing we were talking about was the Aztecs and the Mayas or, or what was happening in Peru with, with, with the Inca uh, civilization. And, um, you know, it always uh, kind of struck me. And I remember there was an, an, an incident in, in school with a, with a history teacher on that in social studies. And I said, well, you know, why don't you talk about what happened in the Caribbean? You know, mm. why, why is it no? Oh, well, those people got wiped out. You know, they, they're extinct. And I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, how could that be if, if, you know, I learned from my family, you know, grandmother and that, that we have this indigenous ancestry. And, uh, you know, how could it be that, that we were wiped out if, if, if they're saying that? So, you know, you have to think that as a kid and with the teacher saying, oh, no, but that's that's what we, we you know, those folks are wiped out. You know, you can't really be that. Uh, there must be some mistake. You know, there's this kind of identity crisis, you know, starts to develop because, you know, you learn from the families to, to respect your parents and your elders. And at least that's the way, you know, I grew up, right? Mm. And, um, and also, you know, you especially respecting grandmother and, and, and so, you know, when you're, but you're also told when you go to school, okay, respect the teachers, you have to listen to them, respect them because they're, you know, doing this, this job for you. And, um, so it kind of sets this, this kind of, um, dilemma in your mind, like, do I listen to the teacher who I was told to listen to and they're saying that we're kind of wiped, wiped out or do I listen to, you know, my family and where, you know, maybe my grandmother or even my, my parents don't have the same type of education, right? Yeah. Educational background as the teacher does. So, you know, you see what I'm saying that mm. it, it puts this kind of psychological thing in, in your mind um, that, that creates a conflict and that also affects identity um, so you have that kind of inadequacy feeling about expressing who you are and, and, you know, maybe my, my, my story wasn't different from other, from other kids who grew up in an urban environment at, at that time. But, you know, later as, again, as you, as I met people and, you know, they kind of affirmed and, and I was surprised that they knew, you know, it kind of drew me into, okay, well then it's okay to, to link up with the community. And then I started to meet actual community members and, you know, to, oh, come to this meeting, come to this. And, and so, you know, this is what it is. You know, um, this is one of your drums. This instrument is ours, you know, and, and that, all of that kind of intrigued me. And, you know, I wanted to know, well, why was a lot of this stuff taken from us? You know, mm. why, you know, don't we know this? Or why are we, you know, into this religion when we had another, you know, way of looking at or interacting with, with, with the spiritual aspect of the world. And so I started questioning all those things. And so that, that time at the UN, you know, as I said, that mentorship that I received from, from a, a lot of these folks really helped to, to fortify me and, uh, you know, and, and really started me off in, in, in that good way. Mm. <laughs> say that. Right. Fasc fascinating how, um, you know, it, it is, is lack of a better word is about like uh, discovering yourself, you know, and when, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're growing up, uh, you're, you're in indigenous heritage, um, living in an urban environment. And when people ask you like, uh, what, Hey, where you're from? And you explain, um, Taino, like, do, do they, do they, um, recognize you oh yeah that's from from, from uh, puerto rico or borinquen or whatever or do you have to like go over and over and over about uh, explaining that when you were a kid or when you were you growing up yeah it, it's changed a bit i think that you know with the with the internet and um all the documentaries that have been done you know, on that subject and on, on Columbus, it's changed. More people are aware now, but when I was younger, people didn't know mm. Taino at all. And even the term Taino itself, you know, our folks back in the day when, when they were meeting Columbus, there was all kinds of ways to express and identify themselves, but it was not really in the same 
nationalistic terms that that we use today like when we say you know american or puerto rican or cuban like there's these nationalistic identities that form around and i think that you know now you know with, with indigenous peoples and, and rightly so as peoples there's there's that kind of nationalism like i'm from this tribe mm. from this community and this is this is who i am but i th- i don't think that um you know back then it was the same right and is that you know maybe that oh yeah uh, oftentimes you know people are described um by what other people how other people describe them mm. <laughs> So that that's some that's that's one way that that some names have come about, but um, Taino is like a, an expression, a self-identification expression. It has to do with um, right action as, as a community member or people or a human mm-hmm. being, you know. And so, in other words, we can translate it very simply to good people, right? <laughs> it's two concepts in that word Taino. Um, coming together to form this kind of idea good people but it's not this binary good versus evil type of judeo-christian um idea of good or or that that good concept in that way it's more about right action like what are you doing for the community like are you you know here to help or here to harm you know right yeah Uh, you know in in that in that type of way so there was a couple instances where in those early uh, encounters, that term is used as, as a form of, of self-identification. Mm. So, you know, we use the term Taino, and, and now, you know, that term is used in a more nationalistic to, to bring our people together because that language and culture was spanned such a large territory, you know, throughout the Caribbean islands and even into the southern tip of Florida, that, um, you know, it's a way to bring our, it's a legitimate way to describe yourselves right and uh, but um it comes from our language it was not made up uh from from the spaniards uh, you know for mm. example or it didn't even come from another um, community it was something that that our people said it was part of the language so it's it's perfectly legitimate to use the phrase but it's just used differently now than than what it was back in the days of, of our ancestors and um so, you know, when you ask the people know in the in in the very early stages, no, a lot of people didn't know, and, and that was the whole problem that we really saw and continue to see with the educational system, is that everybody knows about Columbus, right? That he landed and who did he meet? Indians. Mm. You no, know, okay, that he met indigenous peoples in the Caribbean who identify themselves as Taino monks, other ways that they could have identified themselves back then as well, and. Um, you know, so that, so what I'm saying is Taino pro- wasn't the only way that, that our people identified themselves or were identified in, in before uh, the arrival of Columbus, but it, it's, it's certainly legitimate and, and just, you know, brings to mind the, you know, there's a complexity when we talk about these things. So, you know, so many years after that colonization period, you know, mm. the Caribbean was ground zero for all of that. You know how they treated people, loss of language, you know, prisoners in your own homeland, so to speak, and and uh, you know this this really oppressive um, religious initiative, right? Mm. That really tried to to wipe out and make us feel that we were inadequate, right? We were not really human beings. And they told you that and they wrote that. And, and so it's not something that I'm exaggerating. You could just look into history from their own writings, the way they described who our, who our ancestors were. And so, um, yeah, so there has been change over the years. Now many more people are know, especially other, you know, for a while I was, I was probably, you know, just maybe myself and a few other Taino engaging. And mm-hmm. then now there's, there's been more over the years and, and, uh, you know, so that that also raised the visibility of of our folks, and not only but not only of Taino, but also indigenous peoples in the insular Caribbean, meaning island people, right? Where the other islands, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and so, you know, that that's yeah, it's changed a little bit, but yeah, still overall, I, I'd say that more people know who Columbus is than, than know who the Taino are. Right. Um, 
there's a lot of things popping into my mind actually that I want to ask you about. Uh, but the last point that you, um, the last thing that you said, is that for a very long time you were the only Taino representative at, at the UN. Um, for a very long time, my mom was the same thing, uh, uh, the only Maluku representative. How did you um, experience all that? You know, like um, um, it must feel like you're you're, you're juggling with twelve ball, uh, keeping twelve balls in the air um how did how did you handle that like i said in the beginning i didn't know much right mm. uh, it's not like i had an educational background i mean i just explained that you know, the education system really glossed over my folks they kind of mm. told me that that i didn't exist and uh, i developed a very um let's say aggressive posture against western religions i was like i'm not going to do I'm not going to go to their colleges and I'm not going to do this. I could learn all this myself mm. and uh, I could be a, a, you know, I could speak and write and, and which I could, I was always a, a good student, uh, you know, in, as far as aptitude, right. And mm. what I could do, I, I was not, you know, not that I couldn't do work, but I just didn't like the system. Right. And, and I, that was my re way of rebelling. Mm. Of course, now I think like, these were all those wasted years you know but um i could have just got that stuff done so i tried to tell my kids now <laughs> let's get it done because at a certain point yeah you can do a lot without that um, education but unless you're um you know a celebrity <laughs> you know um that platform that that to get to the all the platforms that you want to go you know an, an education really also helps mm. uh, in, in, in many respects to for people to take your word seriously or at least it did for a while i don't know about anymore but you know um so many people have abused the, the educational system but yeah so the only taino i mean I, I started to go and then um as I mentioned in the beginning, the, one of the conditions of going was to kind of get information out to the mm. community, right? And so I would try to impart that information as, as much as I could. And then when opportunities for others to be a part uh, were made available, you know, we, we definitely continued there, right? So, you know, um, there was there was um, an elder in my community, uh, Daniki Reyes Ocasio, who had started that process at the UN, and she was the one who kind of um, understood that we needed to be at these meetings, but she was heading to Puerto Rico or Boriquen, and, uh, you know, so she was one of the, amongst the, those who had asked me, but, you know, keeping in contact with her and others who were interested in this issue, and, um, you know, then the other, the other important component was, you know, Taino were not just from Boriquen, right? There was, there's, there was, and there are, you know, Taino in Cuba and Dominican Republic, and Jamaica, and, and, and other places. Mm. And so, you know, how do we get the information out to them? So then there was mobilizing going on in the islands that we also had to be a part of, and, and linking up that linked us up with uh, the Kalinago and the Carib peoples and the Arawak peoples, uh, the Lokonos and others uh, that were in the islands, and we started to also work on reestablishing those ties between communities and, and mm. uh, you know really taking like an assessment of where we were all at, at at that point in time and so you know when i say that i was the only one uh, meaning that oftentimes physically i was the only one maybe at a meeting in in, in the beginning mm. but i wasn't the only one in the sense that you know there was other people who were vested in my being there and um who I had to get information to. And I started to pick up things very quickly and started to see where you know, there was opportunities, but it was very different than, than what we have now as far as organizing, you know? Uh, and I try to mention this, you know, Rosalia, we worked together uh, with uh, Tribal Link Foundation's Project Access uh, Indigenous Peoples Training Program. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that helps to, to familiarize and orient indigenous peoples with the system. You know, when we started, there was no project access, right? There was right. very few orientation mechanisms available during that time. And, um, you know, we had to learn a lot like was trial by fire. And now there was already some seasoned folks 
in the UN system that were participating at the you know the working group on indigenous populations from you know the, the mid 70s mm -hmm. you know, to to those times and so but you know when they started opening up new york and that it added a whole nother level of of organizing and people and 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 personalities you know so um to participate in meetings uh there was no real funding mechanisms like we didn't have the UN wasn't really set up to like where, you know, there was monies allocated for the participation of indigenous peoples in this. So a lot of these early meetings, you know, to be a part of them and that you had to do all that yourself. You know, mm -hmm. it was, it was a, it was a whole different thing. And that's why I mentioned earlier that I had kind of rearranged my lifestyle and, um, and my work ethic, right. To really, be involved in this movement right and uh you know i could have went a whole nother way i was you know was a singer in a rock and roll band for goodness sakes and and uh you know but, you know in those early years but i uh, i kind of you know saw that this was an area that you know that we needed we needed people right that, that it wasn't like they're saying no there's no room here we needed people to be there you know mm. to, those early negotiations like with the international year and then that followed with the international decade and then the second decade and you know we needed people around to highlight and really raise the visibility of indigenous peoples issues beyond the meetings in Geneva and that really started to open the doors with other UN agencies right they started you know once the permanent form came in and it was like you know how do you mainstream indigenous issues throughout the system right mm. and that's what we advocated for and you know we started to see that you know we were not only needed in in this you know area but we were needed in this area because they're also talking about something that's going to affect our communities or we're needed in this area because so you know there was a lot of space there for people to engage mm. and, uh, you know fortunately you know, we still have some folks who've been around since the 70s, uh, who, you know, some folks that we work with, like Andrea Carmen and, you know, Willie Little Child and, and you know, Chief Willie Little Child and others, uh, you know, who who have, you know, we can glean that information and, and, and work alongside them and and, and um, receive that, that experience, you know, but, um, you know, in those earlier days too, those those folks were very busy too, just <laughs> doing what they, they needed to do, and they continue to be busy, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, um, oftentimes physically, yes, alone, Taino, a lot in the beginning. Yeah. And, um, but I never felt, you know, so alone. But it it, it there was that feeling of um, there is a heaviness to it, right? Because these are serious issues, man, that we're talking about. At, mm. at the, and oftentimes we've seen it over the years that, that we're talking about life and death struggles. You know, so, you know, at, when that kind of reality sets in and what are you doing there? And, and, you know, we hope that, that, that clicks in to, you know, with the passion, but also, you know, the ethical part about being, being there as well, that it's not just, now, you're not just going there to talk, right? You're really going there to try to affect change. Mm. We know that the UN is not the silver bullet that's going to solve all of our problems, but it's definitely part of the strategy. You have to be there where people are talking about, you know, for example, the SDGs, right? Mm. The sustainable Development Goals. You know, what what are you talking about development? What are they talking about? Really, they're talking about how do they access and engage the last of the resources that we have left on this planet. Right? Right. That, that's the bottom line of what they're talking about. And where are most of those resources that are left on this planet on indigenous people's territories? Right. Right. So I think we need to be in the room when they're talking about what they're going to do with those territories and to remind them of our inherent human rights, right? The, right to free prior and informed consent, the right to self-determination, all those things that they espoused when the UN was formed mm. you know, after World War II, when they saw that, you know, what tyranny could really do to the human condition and, and, and to, to the planet, right? That they started talking about human rights in that, in that big way. But, 
you know, again, our peoples, right, who had already experienced all this, you know, racism and, and neglect and, and abuse through through the colonial systems, mm-hmm. right? You know, were we really thought about during those discussions? I would say no. Mm. <laughs> but we are part of the human family, and and you know, um, we you know, that it's our right to be there, and it's our right to to speak out when they're talking about, you know these issues, these core issues that will affect us, the land, the water, the air, right? It's right. all going to affect us, and not only us, but, you know, as the elders always say, that what about the future generations? What are we leaving for them? So yeah. that's when I say that, you know, as a younger person, when you start with coming to those kind of realizations where the heaviness comes in and why it's important to also, in my view, it's important to also link up to the spiritual aspect of things so that it doesn't become an overburden on you. Yeah. Right. Um, you can kind of go back up, a, kind of go back a little bit, because something that, that you, you talked about when you talk about spirituality, uh, but also the, um, what I sense and what I gather is that there's um, obviously Columbus, um, he got lost let's get this straight like he got this, this guy got got lost he didn't discover anything he got just got got lost and um what um yeah how should i put this the religion versus the um the spiritual worldview that the taino have um um yeah could you what is this? Yeah, maybe that's a better question. What is the spiritual worldview that that the that the Taino have, like pre Christianity? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's important because it really highlights the impacts of colonialism. Mm. That that oppressive imposition of, of foreign religion on our on our peoples. Right. And. You know, when I say a foreign religion, I'm, I'm talking about this kind of dogma, right? Because the tenets of the religion, and in our case, it would be Christianity, right? The first encounter was uh, with the kind of Roman Catholicism um, for us. But Christianity as a whole, you know, there's a certain way that they view the world or at least those leaders did and it was really linked to uh how can we put this it, like a a my way or the highway kind of philosophy it wasn't like it was aggressive live it let live it, yeah it was and and in many ways there's still aspects of it that's mm. more aggressive and um you know I, I it's a little painful to say things when i know and have friends who are, you know, part of family members who are part of that religion. Mm. But um, that's the way I see it, you know. And, yeah. and I've had discussions about this, and I and I feel that it's it's aggressive, as as you mentioned, and and I would you know agree with you. So, right away, uh, here's a fundamental difference. So, in Taino culture, you know, the there's a link or, or there's an understanding that you know when the when the universe the energies of the universe first started to move mm. and took form it took form in like this female energy right this this motherly energy uh, and so you know there's this mother there's this universal mother uh, that becomes you know the land and the water the ocean right because mm. we're islanders right so she's the ocean and and, and the land right. and but you know she's the universe as, as, as a whole and so we say ataveda so from ataveda comes you know the others right the, who, who are born and and um we say yokahu baguamano koti you know and that's linked to the energy of the sun and the sun as as a kind of masculine energy and but you know before yokahu there was atabe right and um you know before all that there's just 
there's a spirit, right? There's this mm-hmm. energy, right? That's neither one or the other. Right. But, you know, when it takes form and it manifests, you know, the first form is the motherly form. Mm. And so it, it's very different, right, from, from Christianity, which is like, you know, God is the father, right? And then that, that um, line is then transferred to the king, who is the representative at that time, you know, mm-hmm. uh, of God on the earth. And then the, the, the leader in the household is, is the father. So you see that it's, it's a very, you know, we use the term patriarchal sense, right, of that mm. this kind of lineage of power is, is through uh, a male line. And, um, you know, what I've come to understand that even that, that word father <clears throat> coming from, from the original Latin, you know, links up to, you know, kind of like ownership, you know, sl- almost, you know, slave owner type thing. You mm. know, like there's a power structure in, in the word that that's linked up to this concept of dominion. Mm. And so when you look at the Taino side, you could see that, you know, so here you have people who are growing up with that sense, right? That sense of where it's, you know, there's this, this, this legacy of dominion over, over land, over resources, and, and uh, over women. And, um, you know, then on this side, you have a communities, you have communities that were taught that, you know, everything comes from a mother, you mm-hmm. know, and that the mother gave, you know, birth to everything else, that even the, even the strong male deities, right, or, or energies, however you want to describe it. And um, so right there, there's a clash, you know, because uh, in Taino culture, um, like a lot of the leadership lines were traced through the, the, the female heritage or that lineage. Mm. So um, when, you, when you use a term, like I mentioned, the term that's linked to the sun or, or the, the creator term, yokahu bagua mauro koti, it's supposed to translate to like um, the spirit or the breath of the yuca, yuca's cassava manioc. Mm-hmm. That's like the main staple of our culture, and um, uh, he's that breath. That, that's the breath of that yuca, the spirit of that yuca, of the ocean, without a male ancestor, right? Like that's how the name kind of translates. So you know, it acknowledges right there that. There's not a male. It always came from a, you know, that that female energy, right? So right. that matrilineal line in that way, and and, it's, and I say that in in that respect because it's not like I don't want to be, you know, over romanticize or, you know, um, promote something that that's not really factual. It's not saying that the women were the leaders per se in the community, but that there was more of a balance in right. leadership. Right, that everyone had specific roles, and the women's mm. role was just as important as the man's role. And at the end of the day, you know, we know where it all began, right, from from our mother. So even when you use a term like home, it, it means like your mother, right? Even the, the, the house itself, it's linked to that, right? Like you're going go go home means go to your mother, right? Like that's right, you know, in that kind of spiritual sense, right? And so, um, you know, and that could be the land, right? You know, that's all of that. It has this sense in it. It's all built in there in the language. And so, you know, it puts us at, at a click because they couldn't understand why Taino women, you know, could take up arms or even be what we call cacique or leaders of, of, of community, you mm. know. Uh, and, and it's not like, there was an even split of, okay, this many women leaders and this many men, because, you know, the way nature of things, it was a lot of men who were, who were, who were in the leadership position in that position with that title. Mm-hmm. But they were not, you know, there was instances where women were, had that title and women were very, you know, apt with, with uh, bow and arrow and, and, and other things, because, you know, what happens when the men go out, on these expeditions for hunting or trading or, or, or things like that, you know, who's, you know, people, like you said, with the UN 
uh, this discussion that we were we were doing early in the pre-talk, right? Mm. Where with the, when the these you see these security guards from the UN in another place, who's watching the UN? Well, right. You know, who's watching the homeland? Right. And right. People step up, whether you're a male, woman, or or you know, however you describe yourself. Mm. So, um, you know, the Spaniards didn't understand why women had that level of authority or why they were so respected, you know, compared to what they were used to on their side, right? Right, yeah. Because they're also bringing in this kind of concept, and this is really just with the impact of religion, This also this ideology of, of machismo, you know, like the tough male and... and right. You know that that idea of what is masculine. Hmm. You know, again, it's it links us back to this concept of dominion. Like, you know, you have to be, you know, over over the woman, and you tell the woman what to do. This is my house. You know, like all all that kind of stuff that we've been fed. You know, like in this kind of toxic yeah. way. And um, so it it's set up at odds. So right there. You know, there was there was folks who didn't agree with that and um, who didn't agree with that. So, you know, you had conflicts very early on between Taino and, and the Spaniards, besides the fact that they were, of course, trying to enslave us. And, and they did enslave many of our people. That's a fact. Mm. You know, they had, uh, you know, the old, this, you know, these folks are coming out of 800 years of war. Right. You talk about the Crusades and, and, yeah. and the battles with the with what we call you know what they call the Moors or the Islamic nations. It's the only thing they knew. Yeah, it's so yeah. you know this is what they and they had depleted most of their resources right when they came over. So you know now they're they're kind of replenishing and all of that stuff. You know how do you think they printed their Bibles? How do you think that religion got so big? Mm. They they sacked and looted this hemisphere. They enslaved our people. They enslaved people from Africa. And, and they built that empire where they had this whole renaissance in Europe and, and mm. all this where the printing press and then, you know, like they, they can afford where because a lot of the resources that they took from here that, that literally just stole. Right. right. And, you know, some people say oh, it was a conquest in this, but if you look at the, yeah, it was a conquest in many respects, but if you look at the way it happened, you know, and, someone will probably come out with all all's fair in love and war but you know, there was a lot of of deals that were made treaties that were made that were broken in other mm. words there was understandings that were came in so that once those folks came in they reneged on those understandings and then you know our people being honorable people we would like to abide by those treaties those treaties when you enter in those agreements there's spiritual aspects of that mm. you know, and, yeah we were a spiritual people, you know, we were and hopefully continue to be uh, if, you know, that really is the basis of, of how we survived, you know, right. you know, there was masking of religion and, and uh, you know, because there was a lot of oppression, right, for folks who, who didn't follow those, those religion, especially in the islands that are smaller mm. than, than some of the main Kalan communities where you know, some communities didn't even get affected, right? for hundreds of years later yeah. right for uh depending on on the the impact you know on when and where and how and, and you know the resources remember these the spaniards didn't come to plant gold right i mean they, they didn't come to plant beans they came looking for gold yeah right and so you know but part of what gave them their impetus to do what they were doing was that they had an arrangement with the organized religion at the time that they would also make converts right and that that whole idea of, of conversion mm. right? so there's there's aspects of that of the religion that you know we can definitely agree with and, and people understood and, and they can understand it and, and you know there's this idea of, of of love love thy neighbor and that but some of the things that they were preaching you know they certainly were not manifesting mm. in the case of our people and you know treating us so horrifically that you know mentally spiritually you know the, those those wounds they they still exist we're still impacted by that by those early colonial arrangements right the, that condition you know it still affects everything around us and, and even the way the whole world is run and why you know um, indigenous peoples are looked at in this kind of 
kind of patriarchal sense like in other words the you hear this term in the movies sometimes or or you know or people kind of you know play this up a little bit like, like the great white father right mm. you know and, and and we've since then interpreted that to to becoming the white man's burden you know and again this is not to to belittle um, a group of people but you know, you have to be realistic <laughs> on the encounter and, and, and what, and what it is, you know, they really felt like they had to convert us and change. Like we were, we were so foreign to their view that they had to convert us. I mean, you know, we're, we're people from the Caribbean who very, wore very little clothing, you know, and, and, you know, what are these more like cover yourself up and, you know, these kind of, different ways that were not really so healthy, you know, mm -hmm. in the environment that, that you were in. And, and even so much that our folks used to bathe, uh, we're in the Caribbean, you know, you sweat when you work and you work for what you have and not things just didn't magically appear. You had to work with the environment and, and there was agro food forestry going on. There was fishing going on, but in, in sustainable manner and, and all these things happening, but you know, people were, were known in communities in a communal sense to, to bathe three times a day, yeah. you know, to gather in the mornings and the, in the afternoons and then, then in the evenings before, you know, uh, they would do whatever it is they need to be done. And when the Spaniards came in, they saw that, that as an unhealthy practice because they were not used to bathing that, you know, what, once a month, you know, like in, they're coming from a dry Iberia where they were not, you know, <laughs> You see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. All of this is mixed in with, with religion. Why do you think they needed all those perfumes and, and, and everything, you know, because they were not bathing. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this is like something you could, yeah, it sounds funny, right? And it, it's mm. almost sounds like I'm trying to be cheeky about the thing, but this is the reality of what was going on. And you know, they, people can review that for themselves. Yeah. And, um, you know, throwing look at what was going on in Europe, right? dark ages, throwing excrement out windows right into the street, into the gutters. And, and mm -hmm. you know, like that wasn't happening, you know, in, in a Taino community. Yeah. You know, the, the Spaniards themselves, again, they wrote this up themselves that they couldn't believe how clean, you know, like the floors were in the homes, like, like in the villages, like they were amazed by, by a lot of the things that they saw. Right. But, um, you know, this wasn't their amazement it didn't wasn't enough to hide their greed right and and their and their thirst for 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 um, enriching themselves at our expense right and so you know there was a lot of devastation and, and that you know that practice continued and, and that way of people interacting continued for a long time where you have like you know this concept of of peasants like peons and 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 patrons right mm. patrones y peones in, in spanish and, uh, you know, where, where somebody is like the, the head of the plantation and, and you have your, you know, either enslaved folks or indentured servants or something like this is the, the like what continued. Right. And, and again, you know, they weren't they weren't really um, highlighting uh, the rights uh, of peoples, although and this is something that that people also don't know is that, you know, people did speak out about these abuses and also spoke about the rights of man. And, and that led into what, you know, later during the French revolution, the social contract and all of that. So mm. there, there was a sense of, of a right and wrong and that, you know, these, these things, this shouldn't happen. So we can't say that, you know, let's not compare them um, the way to the standards of today. Mm. There was already some comparison going on. There were, and interestingly enough, uh, many of these people who, who spoke out or, or the, the main voices who spoke out at that time were religious people. So mm. you had the dilemma, right? Where, you know, some of these folks really wanted to embody what their religion was actually preaching. Um, and so they spoke out for indigenous rights, uh, you know, for the rights of people, right? Mm, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that was, that feeling wasn't embraced by those, all those in power, you know? Mm. So, yeah, so when you talk about the religion, the difference in religion, which was what your original question is before I veered off into. The no, religion, please, um, please. You know, that we see that very, very clearly in, in the just the core ideology of, you know, where we all came from. Right. right? And um, 
So yeah, and and all of that stuff affects us today. Yeah. What um what I wonder as well is um the Taino as a peoples how did how do you, you you talked about there's a certain type of for lack of a better word hierarchy right um that there, there, there's um, um there's this 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 uh, there's a structure in that that that, that governs the, the the Taino um yeah is it was there or is there some kind of a uh, um some form of the governance structure or a government of the of the Taino back then or or it still exists yeah of course there was there was governmental structure you know governmental structure is is really like community administration right mm -hmm. is how do you you know how do you organize and how do you mobilize the extended families that exist in in communities right that, right. that communities that become towns you know towns that become regions Right, so there was there was, of course, structure and, and leadership. As I mentioned, we had uh, I mentioned the word that was used for um, one uh, part of the leadership, cacique, which is like you know, lack of a better word, chief or chieftain. Mm -hmm. Right, but there was other people that that worked along with that chief to make things happen. Who, you know, fishing expeditions had to be organized. People had to work fields right to to grow you want to eat you gotta you have to organize community to work around that and mm -hmm. some of these fields you know you're talking about fields that that could sustain thousands of people yeah <laughs> you know, it's not just just one you know couple of huts you know like in a in, in some kind of a movie that that you might see you're talking about communities that were organized and interchanged from community to community which is why many of uh, the leadership people intermarried their families uh, so that these, there would be this familial uh, connections as well. And, um, you know, the, this is why the Taino language and culture really extended beyond one island all the way across. Why mm. when these early Spaniards went to different islands and they, the Taino people that they had with them, or these Caribbean islanders, they could speak with others from other islands in, in you know, the same or a very similar language, yeah. because because of that that idea, you know. So that that there was more of a sense of diplomacy, you know, for for use of the word like that was elevated. Mm. Right? This, this idea, and you see that in the earlier encounters, you see the diplomacy playing out when when chiefs you know respected chiefs were captured uh in in warfare and how the people would try to negotiate mm. their freedom and their families or you would see these negotiate these attempts at negotiation by chiefs to um kind of quell the the insane greed of the, of the spaniards you know there there's a one very famous story uh where a cacique guayone he is talking to to one of these spaniards and he's saying look he takes them out to the fields that we call conucos, you know, these large uh, labored fields of, of, of all these uh, staples that, that we eat, what sustains the communities. Mm -hmm. And he shows them, he shows this Spaniard all these fields. And he says, look, we can grow food to feed you here and to feed your people back home, you know just give us a break from this gold stuff, you know, like going out and trying to find, you know, like, like he was trying to negotiate, you know, some terms of coexistence, mm. you know, yeah. where, you know, his people could live and, and not be in this form of semi enslavement that they called the encomienda at the time, kind of like an indentured servitude. What, you know, another thing that they brought over from, from that side of the world, yeah. that feudal system. And, uh, you know, because it really didn't give you the opportunity to, to do what else you needed to do, you know, and especially not fulfill your ceremonial commitments and your spiritual commitments, mm. which, you know, as Taino people, we have spiritual commitments with the world around us. Mm -hmm. But he tried to negotiate the terms of coexistence with that Spaniard and said, you know, really the whole idea was let's forget about this gold stuff, <laughs> you know, really that's not so important. It's the food that's important. You could see the, 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 the concept of food security mm. and how valuable food was and that that leader was saying, we could take care of you guys and we could take care of your folks back home. Let's just chill out on the 
on this other stuff that's going on. This, yeah. this of course, the Spaniards did not, you know, go for that. No. But it gives you an idea of negotiation, right? And the diplomacy that was under, going undertaken. And so much so that he says, he shows them, uh, we have a digging stick called uh, koa that you work the, the fields with. Mm. Um, and even today, people still have that digging stick, even though some they make them out of metal now and, and, and with a you know, metal tip on them, but they still call it a koa. Mm. And, uh, so he took one koa, he says, you know, one koa is... is is only good this, but when you take a lot of koas, you know, this is where the strength is, right? So he was linking that that idea of coming together, right, with the fields <laughs> and and that strength of unity. You know, when yeah. all these koas come together, we could really take care of, of the community. Hmm. Interestingly, I've heard similar stories amongst other indigenous peoples, but it shows you that our way of thinking is very similar when you're close to the land in, in that way and so uh again spaniards didn't take up that 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 notion but that idea of diplomacy was really looked looked highly upon in in taino culture mm -hmm. so there there was of course um structure uh governmental structure and that was one of the first things that was that was attacked uh besides the spirituality where um so much so that one, they would target the chiefs and leaders in in warfare. Mm. They did this by out and out attacks or very very sneaky things. There's there's one um, there's one story that that gives you an idea of this where there was a a, a, a woman leader, uh, the cacique Anacaona, and uh, she was a highly respected chief. And the Spaniards said, listen, you know, we want to talk to the chiefs. There's a lot of things going on, and maybe you're misunderstanding us. You know this that type of conversation mm. but uh you know, why don't you get all the chiefs together so that we could have um you know eat food together and talk about these things and come to some kind of an agreement so she was able you know due to her stature and her respect as a leader she was able to gather 80 chiefs from the region 80 uh from the region and the the, the accounts is about 80 mm. anyway they had a very large meeting hall uh, one of these, what we call kane in the, in the Taino language. And so uh, they met, you know, they got all those chiefs there. They were like, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to do some. There was always like some sort of entertainment or games or, or music or, or, or dance that would, you know, these were the type of guy. These are the things that we do when we met. You know, there was always that. So there was going to be um, some food uh, brought in. So when they, they got all those chiefs in there. The Spaniards closed all those doors, locked all, you know, secured all those doors, and they lit that place on fire. Mm. So when the chiefs started to come out of that building, you know, then they would attack them. But you see, you, you see what I'm trying to say here. Our people were trying to negotiate. Yeah. Continuously, we tried to negotiate. You know, throughout, you could see this throughout the early colonization period. That there was all these negotiations, and and people might say, oh, well, that was dumb. You guys were were stupid for believing them but that was our culture you know we were not used to people who didn't keep their words and who mm. were so treacherous you know that you know i don't know if this is like a re if people can actually grasp that you know how you know how that would be look like it's it was almost unheard of that if you were coming together in that way that you would try to do some t sort of treachery that mm. the level of, of of consciousness that our people had attained Know, and that's not romantic that's why they went in there you know and uh so at the end you know how anacaona was was um was thanked for her getting all those people together in her diplomacy efforts she was hung you know and uh you know by the spaniards mm. so this is the, this is the legacy but you see that what i'm trying to say about diplomacy and, and, yeah. and, this. and this all again you know where are the religious figures where are the you know where are the all those folks who who are supposed to be, you know, for love one another and, and all that. And, and right. this, you know, there's there's this linkages uh, between all of this, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's not like you can't silo one part of the discussion, right, into without taking into to context another part of the discussion. And so, you know, this is this is what 
you know, yeah, this is what I have to share on, on, on that. And, and there's there's a lot more stories, but it, it kind of gives you the, the idea of, of, you know, that level of spirituality, that level of, you know, why somebody would come up with a term like noble savage, right? Mm -hmm. you know, with that sort of, that sort of respect, that, that leadership. And, and so when these folks uh, started to wipe out the leadership and all those, you know, knowledge holders in, in, in that way, you know, um, in some instances, you know, some of the people, you know, they, they, they did a number of things. Either they gave up, right, and they took their own lives, you know. Mm. They fought, right, uh, against them. And, and oftentimes because of, like I said, you know, you're talking about people with 800 years of battle experience, right? Right, yeah. Armor, cannons, uh, early, early, um, version of, of the rifle called the arquebus attack dogs i mean you know large mastiffs and and you know dogs that were trained to rip people apart hmm. you know, all, all all of these things that were part of you know our people were not were not geared in that way they were not wired you know in that sort of just like wiping out other people's you know completely you know like right. that. and then there yes there were battles and i'm not trying to say that we were you know it was all kumbaya and our people were just <laughs> you know not but it was not a sense that where you would wipe somebody out of existence you know mm -hmm. like wipe a whole people out of existence you know in, in this way or there would be no way for the you know to, to talk about things or come to some sort of an arrangement and um you know so that that's what was going on so one that they fought right some people fought two they either you know gave up their lives and three they kind of acquiesced to what was going on and became part of the system. Mm. So what happens? Some of the chiefs who were concerned about their own families became part of that, uh, that kind of feudal system. And they became what the overlords yeah. in certain, in certain communities. Right. Mm. So, so there that office and that title, which was once more respected became to be like the foreman, you know, the, mm. the the foreman of, you know, in other words, like they took part in a demise of their own folks. Right. But, you know, I don't know what was going through everybody's heads, but I, you know, as, as a father and, and that, you know, maybe people do and, and take things that are, take decisions that are based on, on survival, you know, mm. and, you know, we probably can't understand the, the, the horrors that were, I don't think we could understand the horrors that were being inflicted on, on, on those people. They were beyond cruel. And right. you can see this in, 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 in wars and things like that. Now you could see some of that in Rwanda and, and other places where you have some evidence of, the, of you know, how cruel people can be to each other. But they were really cruel to, to, to my ancestors. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that we have any blood left is, 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 is a testimony to, to who we are as a people and to the various survival mechanisms. So I'm not here to be judged by any other indigenous peoples or I'm just laying out what how I see the things go you know and, and whether people thought that we were foolish or that that was the way pe our people are and, and we're not here to you know to apologize for for who we were you know we had a standard right that that right. that our people tried to live up to and they and boy they tried you know you can't say that they didn't try right you know and um so that 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 takes us you know to now so when you talk about now you know those those offices and that structure was really took a hit you mm. know in the estimation of the people so then the kind of leadership went to more clans and back to the clans and families themselves so you had like whole families that you know moved around island to do work you know working in the coffee fields and that the living in their own homelands is not like you know we were gone from where we lived you know it's just that idea of ownership and, and right and, you know um you know, what we could do, mm. as I mentioned, you even found ways to practice the spirituality aspects of spirituality in ways that, again, were survival mechanisms like syncretic religions were formed that, you know, when Africans who were enslaved were started to be brought over to the islands uh, to also take up, you know, that, that work, that labor force, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, where did those Africans escape to? They escaped to our, you know, communities or, you know, and, and, and um, they linked up with the people. And, and so even in these other areas where uh, even urban areas or, or the areas where the Spaniards controlled, 
because that's another thing that I think people, you know, don't think about when they think about the conquest. They think that the Spaniards rolled in one day and everything changed overnight. You know? mm. It wasn't like that. You know, there was a few Spaniard towns, you know, here and there, and, and you know, there was some warfare. But you know, like I said, when when you're, you know, trying to do things in certain ways and and, and that. You know, people were kind of left to their devices in, in other parts of the islands and, they, you know, to do what they needed to do or, or, or whatever until more of them came in and then they took over, right? And then so it got harder and harder. And I think that other uh, indigenous peoples saw that in in, in their own versions of, of their conquest periods or, or their warring periods or those colonial periods, however, you know, people want to describe or you know, what's ever better or better way to describe the condition that, they, that they're in. But I think they saw that as that, you know, once some get in, then more, and it's hard because they keep coming, right? It's not right. like you're, you know, you're going to wipe out some and then that's going to be it. They're going to keep coming, right? That's mm. what happened back then. And uh, so, you know, people had to make, you know, decisions, you know. And so, um, you know, then a lot of that leadership and a lot of that, you know, communal communal sense went back to more clans and family oriented and, and it's more recently that uh, people have are trying to reinstitute institutions you know of that now th this is taino sense like in other islands like on the island of dominica there's uh, the carib kalinago community um they have they kept their chiefdoms uh and they were acknowledged like that but they had a different uh, colonizer the english mm. And uh, there was a different way that they, they were dealt with, and they have a, a territory on that island. So the only real government kind of treaty territory in the Caribbean is, is on the island of Dominica. But it's not to say that our folks don't exist or continue to exist in, in, in lands that their families have held for generations or been on for generations. They're still there in the Caribbean, but now you're just surrounded by all this other stuff, right? All these right. things that, that we're where the 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 imposition and the sh kind of strength of those national identities right come forward like you know so yeah. who, who are we now are, are we you know Puerto Ricans or you know are we Peruvians or are we Ecuadorians or are we indigenous peoples right with our own governments you know, right this is you know what are we multi or what they call in Bolivia plurinational right mm -hmm. uh, you know so that that also has to be, you know, that's also part of a discussion now. But it's certainly not, you know, the the normative that idea of plurinationalism, right, is not the normative in the Americas. Mm. And, uh, although, you know, that's one of the things that that that's fought for, right? The right to self determination, and uh, you know, why people call themselves, you know, this is the Taino Nation, for example, or the, you know, this because you're you're reinforcing that we are a peoples. Right? We are peoples, just like any other peoples, and we have the right to self-determination. So in that same sense over years, you know, um, and, as, and as needed, people have been trying to reinvigorate those, those institutions. But again, you know, institutions that were, you know, really took a beating, you know, over the course of colonialism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, where, where leadership was, was then again more clan-based. And so uh, beyond that, you know, we also try to link now, as I said in the beginning, uh, when we're talking more about how I got into this, you know, part of our work was not only to engage the UN system and to be part and have our voices part, but also part of our work to, was to re-tie those ancient right. community relationships mm -hmm. that we had from island to island all the way down into the mainlands. Hmm. So whether it be South America, Central America, or, you know, up into North America. So that that's like another focus. So that's why I say is that, you know, the UN is not the only strategy we have towards our liberation or, or self-determination. You know, it's also reconnecting those ties that we had as indigenous peoples that sustained us in the past, you know, to, to leading us back up. And I think that that's a focus of, of main focus of where we have today yeah yeah it, it sounds like and i think there's a lot of indigenous peoples are working on that uh particular strategy i would say that there, there, there's one thing to to use the un because you you're trying to master the un system you know and so it's in order to 
to change it. So it, that that's a little bit of the, the, the state building aspect of it. But then again, reinvigorating your culture, um, the ties uh, between islands, between communities, that's part of, of nation building. You know, it, that's, so those two things are super important. And it's, and I think that, um, uh, yeah, some, in the, yeah, some indigenous people, some uh, conversation that that I, that I tap into, that I listen to, like it's it's too focused on the on the on the on the yeah on, on the UN stuff. Whereas, like you 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 definitely need to see the UN as a um as a as a tool, not as a goal, you know, as a tool to to get to where you want to go, and 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 not to um um uh, yeah get to too much to focus on the on the on, on on the UN or or OAS or anything anything along, along those lines um, what th- those stories and th- these are super inspiring the indigenous diplomacy um, what the, the, the first treaty in the western hemisphere was between Taino and the and, and the Spaniards you know, that was the first international treaty that was that was undertaken by a cacique Guarocuya. And let me tell you something, when they, you know, people say they don't learn or, or whatever, is that when they negotiated that treaty, they negotiated over a ravine. So the Spaniards were on one side of the ravine and the Taino were on the other side of the ravine to make that deal, you know, and that they you know, advocated for, for a land base. And, and this is in the what we call the Dominican Republic today. But, you know, understanding the treachery of the Spaniards in the past, that, that's how that negotiation took place, where there was a crevasse in between the negotiators so that they wouldn't be, you know, captured or, or had some kind of trickery. But you know, that, that gives you an idea that, you know, there is an international diplomacy that needs to take place in, in, in our discussions as, as indigenous peoples, if we are peoples dealing with other peoples, then that's, you know, that's an international uh, move right there, right? So it's, it's as you said, you know, it's, it's not just the UN. UN is part of the strategy. It's a tool. Just like this, we're using the internet. Is, it's a tool. And, uh, you know, but you also have to think at, at, at the national and, of course, most importantly, at the local level. You have to be able to build those strong institutions at the local level. And so, you know, I certainly agree with you that we're not, you know, as a strategy overall for for nation building, you know, you're not just going to go for international. You really want to make sure that you have a strong foundation. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted to make sure that that I, I added that in there. No, no, definitely much appreciated. And and um, where I was going to was actually is a part of that answer is because. Um, um, these are these examples that you gave, or these stories that you told, um, are super important for the for, for the nation building part. You know, uh, of of like how the, the Taino um, uh, deploy diplomacy uh, 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 negotiations, quote unquote. Um, is that in any way apart from the language um, as well? Because uh, I think language as well is super important. Um, is it being documented? Is 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 that um, being taught or part of curricula in any way that accessible? I think that that that, that that's what I'm what I'm trying to find out. Is is it accessible to the broader Taino people? Um, if you know. Yeah, I, I know. I know. What, I know what you mean, and um, I I see the need, right? But um, you also have to keep in mind is that. You know, since we were the among the first places that were hit in this hemisphere, you know, we have not been supported, right? Our people have, have really, you know, um, not had access to a lot of resources from that time. Besides, their, you know, what what they need to survive, you know. Right. And uh, you know, this is where uh, our earlier conversation about education comes in. You know, about how. Edu- how I felt about education as the as a younger person, and how I've come to see it, you know, as an older person, and um, you know why I think that there's a value, but you know the value comes in if we control those institutions, right? Because 
there's so much manipulation in the Western uh, educational system that's been imposed upon our peoples and that, you know, is a model. Also, a lot of the models come from these kind of religious schools. And, you know, uh, as you can surmise from the, the headlines recently about the, 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 the indigenous children who have been recovered in, in, in Canada mm. and in the U.S. from the boarding school systems, you can surmise that, you know, these educational systems, again, were, were really a part of an assimilation process, right? And it's only through, you know, the, the dedication of, of, of certain individuals who've been able to break into these systems that have been able to change and, and, and formulate like indigenous studies programs and folks who start writing books, you know, because you know, they have a certain degree of, of, of understanding about their cultures and they can go back and look at the history that was written by uh, these oppressive forces and mm. reinterpret them through their own eyes. And that's really what, what the lack has been. As I mentioned, when I was in high school, you know, they when Columbus got here and then we're talking about, you know, Aztecs, Mayas, etc. But, you know, that whole perspective, like, I didn't hear anything about the diplomacy of the Taino in, in those lessons. Mm. Talk, we just learned about how Aztecs allegedly sacrificed, you know, people and, and how much gold they have. And wow, look at their art, you know, like, they had a city. You know, mm. They probably um, used up all their resources, you know, that's why they disappeared. Or, yeah. You know, like all these theories that that others have so it takes our people to get into these system to really kind of reinterpret right and and reformulate and and you know rewire that's that's why um you know one of the one of the first and and, and really important kind of lessons learned from from elders or from from leadership um that i heard early early on was was uh, from russell means and, you know, he was talking about decolonizing your mind mm. right? because that that's the first important step because we're 100 so, percent. We're so fed by some of these systems where we don't even think, you know, and sometimes that you know, the, I mentioned the romanticism on TV as, as a young person, like sometimes we're fed and we even buy into some of that imagery. Mm. Right. And, you know, we're not looking at the reality and the, you know, the diversity of, of, of who our peoples are in, in, in thought and, and in levels of, of organization, community organization and trade and, you know, every every indigenous community, for example, in, in our neighborhood, right, in, in the Caribbean, Central America, South America, in that neighborhood, like, not everybody had to have a city like the Mayas, you know, there could be smaller communities, but we traded with the Mayas, we knew what they did, yeah. we didn't have to do what they did, you mm. know, we had another level of, you know, living and, and structure, you know, you know, you think about that, your contemporaries of folks who are building these, you know, really mega cities, right, at, at that time, and these city centers, but you don't have to, you don't do that yourself. Right. right? So you, you know, you have your own way, but you can trade with them and interact with them, you know, and you know, that shows the diversity of thought that, that you know, what we can do. Mm. Again, not to romanticize fully and say that people didn't have, you know, you know, conflicts with each other, but, you know, there was, there was a lot, I don't think that everybody, that people were about, and I could, maybe I could be wrong, but I don't think that our people were about, you know, genocide of, of, of others, you know, mm. I, I don't, I don't see it, but, you know, maybe somebody could educate me. I hope not, but, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, from the way I interpret and so I'll give you an example uh, and hopefully this you know, I'll try not to go too long with this, but um, there uh, in Puerto Rico, on the Aleno Boriquen, as we say, um, around the 1540s, uh, Spain instituted what they call the, the new law of the Indies. They called the Caribbean the Indies, mm -hmm. right? Like East Indies, West Indies. Right, like Indies right. Over there on that side relates to the whole Marco Polo you know, going into Asia, what, again, for resources, spices, right? It's always mm -hmm. about resources that they don't have. Right. Which is why they're going to these other places, because they sacked and looted their own place, you know? So they have to make these trade arrangements. And so the East Indies, so they make the new law of the Indies. And basically what that new law says is that um, 
you can't enslave Taino people or the Indians anymore, right? The Indians can't be slaves because we were we were found to be humans. They had to have a debate about this, and there was like a three-day debate in, in Spain, Valladolid, and uh, Bartolomé de las Casas, who was like the first um, uh, Catholic bishop ordained in, in the New World, mm -hmm. right? uh, who was who used to be a, a military person and mm -hmm. renounced his his title and his you know all that to become a religious person because he saw the horrors. It hit him so hard that he converted himself to a religious man. But that doesn't say that he didn't have his prejudices also. But you see what I'm saying here. Las Casas had had a, a debate with a, another person named Sepulveda. They had a debate over three days. Sepulveda's uh, intervention came first, basically saying that we're not humans, we're subhumans, you know, we're something else. And then Las Casas went for two days showing how we were humans. Thank right. You, Las Casas, right? <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, so that as a result of that, we're the king and queen of Spain. We're saying, okay, so you you know they're humans. You can't really be enslaving them in, in, in that way, you know. And so they have to have uh, you know ways that they can convert. There has to be you know time for giving them to for prayer and all and all of this stuff. So um, they wanted to read the declaration of this in, on the island of Puerto Rico, and so they wanted to do that in the main town. Again, even at that time, there was not so many towns. So you, it was the main place was this mm. one area, you know. So they they uh, say okay they want to get some Indians in the audience to hear that 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 they're free you know <laughs> so uh, hear the, the the decree so they they gathered up sixty people in the area you know one guy could have been painting a house another one could have been shining shoes you know another one could have been you know serving tea you know whatever the 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 situation was of the people who were living in that town mm. you know, sixty people at that time. And so they gathered them up in the square and they read that report and like, you're all free. And you know, I don't know what it actually meant to any of them, but you know, th this is what happened. So then scholars, the educational system, you, you know, after that says, uh, you know, you'll read in some books. Well, it's unfortunate that the Taino or the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean were wiped out by the time the decree uh, was read because there was only 60 people left in Puerto Rico, 60 Indians left in Puerto Rico to hear the decree. Mm. If you read the account and interpret it correctly, they never said that there was 60 Indians left on the island. They only said that there were 60 people that they were able to gather in that town at that time to read it. Right. So yet, generation after generation expounded those that erroneous interpretation. Mm. And hence, you have all the Tainos were killed and wiped out. There was only 60 left of you in 1540. Oh. So, you know, there was Tainos all through the islands, right? Mm. Same thing with what I told you about the treaty. You know, they said the Tainos there in Dominican Republic were wiped out within 40 years, but that treaty was made well after 40 years. You know, with, with that with that particular community of, of Guarocuya, the Cacique at that time. So there's a manipulation in, in education. So that's why I'm getting back to this idea of the importance of education, but indigenous-led in, uh, education where we can tell our stories and we can interpret. You know what was uh, put forth by you know the the colonial people in in a way that that's that's equitable and in our way that our people can feel proud. So because we have not had the resources in, in the Taino community, because we have not, you know, we were not allocated. You know, we don't have the same conditions as let's say a treaty tribe might have in the U.S. mainland, for example, where there's a certain conditions on their their coexistence. You know. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that, that we had treaty, but those were abdicated, you know, those terms were abdicated very early on. And um, so, you know, there, there, there's no like, um, there's no engagement from the government for Taino as a separate entity mm. where, you know, something can be built up so that we can have resources to help us do these things. So all of this, again, like when we had to travel to the UN and to meetings, we had to pay for ourselves. Right. And so... You know, between getting people together, going to meetings, you know, we talk about things like this, and that's important. Why this type of Zoom meeting is important, where we can record and, and hear some of this stuff from from not you know not only me but other mm -hmm. people who do these type of interviews, the Taino people, where that stuff is. And now, yes, there is a focus to do 
you know these type of, of books and and you know I would love to to be able to to put things and show people these examples of these beautiful interactions from the Taino perspective of what really diplomacy is right and, yeah what it's based on and, and as I mentioned in that one story you saw the link to food right mm. you know like how is it you know like when we see each other as indigenous but let's go get something to eat you know definitely like, right together let's you know like mm -hmm. that's an important part of our interactions yeah which is why we like to go out to eat together without doing these meetings and and you know have that kind of camaraderie because you build bonds and relationships our people knew about that back then right you know? and it's not you know, just because they just like to hang out. Yeah, maybe they do. Uh, you know, we like to have fun as, as well and sing and dance and all that. Um, but, you know, there's a level of diplomacy when you're trading people, when you're a people who are not focused solely on conquest or dominion. You know, your idea is to build a, a safe environment. And the only way that you build that safe environment is by making relationships with people. Right, and right. Not only people, but you make relationships with the animals. You make relationship with the with the land, which is why you know our people traditionally um, harvested turtle eggs, right? But they knew they couldn't take all the turtle eggs. Hmm. Right? Otherwise, there's no turtle coming back the next year, right? So they they had that. You know, obviously somebody must have took the turtle all turtle eggs one time for them to get it. You know, yeah. like somebody had to go through that experiment, but they figured that stuff out pretty quick. Right. You know? Like, hey, we, you know, we have to leave some of this, you know, and that's why, um, you know, that that sort of relationship. So it's not that treaty, that covenant, right? That idea of, of making a covenant is not just a human to human exercise. It's it's also with the land, and it's also with with the animals and the creatures, right? Right. So, you know, you have these covenants. You 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 make these offerings to plants before you pick them. You you talk to the, the to animals. You know, when before you engage in the hunt, or you leave some kind of an offering because you know that you know this is their time. And at one time, you'll revert back also into the earth and become plants that they eat. And you know, like the whole you know circle of life, Lion King, and all uh -huh. that. You could say that in one way as as to be cheeky about it, but there's really a deeper sense in that simplistic what you might think of there's a profound connection in that seemingly simplistic view mm. another thing i learned from elders very early on that we as human beings tend to complicate things especially human beings in this era you know this that we tend to complicate things so much and that really things can be very simple in how we deal with each other you know and that's based on respect you know we have a term for that in taino language is, there's a basic respect that you you deal with people and again this is linked to our, our our idea of diplomacy right so you know going to the un doing these type of things it's not something that our, our folks wouldn't have understood they would definitely have understood the need to sit down and talk with other people mm. affect the well-being of your community so it's not like you know an alien exercise you know some people say ah, why are you going to the un you know like this is some of the things that come up you know that come up but you know there, there's a need for it as i said when they're talking about you know things that will affect the well-being of your communities you need to be there right? you yeah need to say something you know whether they listen or not that's the other thing whether they implement what they agree to you know that that's, that's the other side of the story you know right it's it's so um almost it sounds natural like, like you're telling the stories about like taino diplomacy um as if because you've been as if it informed, it forged your, as it's part of, part of your culture, that forged your, uh, your, your um, style, I would say, at, at, the international at the international advocacy scene w within the UN. Um, say climate change or SDGs, uh, which, you, which, which you worked in, did, did those, did those stories that you just now shared, like did they pop into your mind like once or, once or twice or other stories when, when you went into negotiations or in, there's one story um, I, that I love about you. Oh, what was it like a, a, um, a, a toilet negotiation? What, what was that? Like, that is like every, every time people ask me like, all right, um, what is the weirdest type of negotiation that you experienced? Like, I can only talk about a story that someone else uh, experienced that I didn't experience, but like yours, 
Um, yeah, I don't know. There's so many. Th- <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. tell you. I can tell you. Like, uh, all right. So first of all, absolutely. I don't think that you can enter into any of this work without thinking about your ancestors, right? Like, mm. what are you there for? Of course, you're thinking about your people now and you know suffering that they incur now. But you know, the reason that you're here. <laughs> right is because of your ancestors right right the reason that you're talking about connection to places because so you can't go at least that's the way i look at it you can't go into these things without thinking of you know them and mm. what they did and and the lifestyle like you know i'm not saying that every indigenous peoples were like mine or i'm not trying to say that my ancestors were better than your ancestors you know mm. like that. it's not that dynamic I'm just taking what I feel that, you know, I'm listening to what they had to say. In other words, like the Spaniards didn't listen to them, you know, other people that like, I want to listen to them. I want to hear what they're saying. That's why I take these stories to heart so much because I want to hear what they have to say because it informs me for, as you said, you know, as we went into SDGs, that's why, you know, when, when, when you look at it and that's why I said, what is the SDGs really about? Why is it so important? Because mm. they're talking about development. What what do they develop? When they're talking about development and raising, a, what are they talking about? Farmlands, cutting down forests, accessing, you know, extractive resources. Whose lands do they go on? Right. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, it's us. So they were talking about how they're going to distribute and access the last of the resources left on the planet. So you got to wake up, right? You got to see, you know, the writing for the wall on the wall and, and, and say, this is how you're going to go into it. And if we know how important food was to our folks back then, right? Right. They didn't have, you know, like, then it's important today, you know, right? If it was important back then, it's important today. You know, that idea of food security and, and everybody's talking about it. Now the pandemic rose that up. That inequality, that that level of inequality, and and how anybody could be cut off, mm. right? Even those with some means, right? right? You know, when, when they could be impacted by mm-hmm. by this, yeah. right? So, you know, again, shows you how far thinking and how smart, even though it sounds simple, how profound it actually is. So yes, of course, when I when I think I think about some of these stories, and and you know, there's a couple of things that I I'll go just be very quick. So we were at a meeting in um in geneva and uh you know part of the part of the process is that you can't um as as uh as observers you can't really bring up something in, on the floor no yeah. it has to be other countries you know in this particular process and i don't want to embarrass anybody so i'm not going to go through the you know the whole thing but mm. uh, you have to um, get other countries to bring up what's going on in your country, like to ask questions about it. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I was, you know, the, the U S was, was under a review. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, since we can't take the floor directly to that, we have to have other countries do that. And, um, you know, so I was watching some of the line of questioning in, in that was going on. There was a particular country that, that I saw that, you know, um, seemed to be like a good candidate to, to carry uh, forward. So I w- watched that negotiator and then I saw him go into the restroom. So I followed, you know, I saw him walking out. So I wanted to, you know, follow him out there. I saw him go into the restroom. So I went in there. And so when, you know, we were finishing what we had to do, uh, I said, hey, are you the, the person from, you know, the negotiator from this? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, how you doing? And I introduced myself and I said, listen, um, it would be very important to us if, uh, you know, these issues, we've heard some things come up, but we haven't heard, you know, these issues from indigenous people. So would you consider, you know, bringing these up, these particular points up on the floor? Mm. And, oh, sure. So I had the, of course, I had the document with the paper, with the talking points with me. I just happened to have it right in this, sure. oh, here it is, you know, and so I put it and you know, took it out of my, my jacket and, and handed it over. And then, of course, the next line of questioning, those questions were in in that country's statement right in, in that line of question so that's 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 the funny story so you know um but effective though but it, it is effective right? you know and, and so but you have to watch you know you be observant and you know we know all about being observant as indigenous people so so uh 
when when you went into the SDG, SDGs and, and definitely like people people listening or watching to this, they'll be like, holy shit, did, did, it, this goes really far in the just diplomacy. But yeah, well, like like you said, you know, it, it is as indigenous peoples, um, like the UN, like when they, re they review one each, each other, right? It, it, the, the universal periodic review, and then you have to talk to states and you need, need to like convince a, a state to, to take on board like, what you want to say. So you have to convince them. And if it's, um, yeah, it's, if it's at the toilet, then it, it's, it's at the toilet, you know, it's, um, I just I just imagine myself a lot of in like one of those talls, you know, and then hey, by the way, <laughs> uh, but it obviously what went what went a little bit differently. Um, something that I just that I do want to bring up though, when it comes to your your work, and I want to acknowledge as well, like the immense amount of work that you, Grace Balawag, and. Um, uh, <laughs> Galina and Garova have done on the SDGs. Uh, what I've seen, and, and which is crazy, only three people representing all indigenous peoples for like currently 476 million indigenous peoples all around the world in the SDGs whilst, and this is some it's still mind my, my boggling to me. So you were in one negotiated, negotiation room talking about SDGs down the hall, we were talking about a world conference and everybody was in that room. And so it is, how did you, and you can be honest, like, how do you think about that? That, that there's this SDGs going on, only the three of you, or sometimes just you. And there were a lot of indigenous peoples in the other room down the hall on the, on the world conference, negoti negotiating the modalities on the world conference. And I saw you also going back and forth as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah all, all of it's important. Um... But I think that that's uh, also, you know, testament has to be given to the to the organizations that we were representing at the mm. time, uh, International Indian Treaty Council, which people know was the very first, or if you don't know, you should know, it was the very first ECOSOC accredited indigenous NGO at the United Nations and received that accreditation in 1977. And they've been going strong ever since. And, uh, you know, there was... Uh, also Teb Teba Foundation at the time that they were also engaged engaged in that in that process and they um, asked IITC to be involved saying look this process is going on and nobody's here mm. and uh, so right away uh, you know IITC recognized that for the reasons that I mentioned that this was an important place to have <laughs> to to try to make sure that that the rights of indigenous peoples was acknowledged in some form or another in there you know yeah and um, so we started to engage that. But as you mentioned, you know, this is, a, this is around 20, 2014. Yeah, that, that the process for the World Conference was also happening. So all this effort and this focus was placed on World Conference of Indigenous Peoples, right? And uh, on Indigenous Peoples. And, and so there was like resources being pumped in, you know, from, from these foundations mm -hmm. and, and effort and, and a lot of structure and you were part of that structure mm -hmm. you know, that, that was there and that of course was all important work but we were what we were saying like hey <laughs> over here you know like hey, this is going on too you know like like trying to get people's attention that this is also happening and that, that this is also really important yeah and um because it links into climate change it links into you know all this you know every aspects of our lives and so um you know, we did as best we can to educate folks. And, and I think at during that year at the, um, the permanent forum on indigenous issues, they actually gave me some time to present on that. And it was like a almost like a disaster because my, I had a PowerPoint that was going to go through the whole thing and that they didn't plug it in. And it, oh. it, was, it was like, I was talking, thinking the PowerPoint is going on behind me and I'm like, switch the slide. And then finally there's no slides until, you know, oh man, it was a mess. But the idea was that, um, you know, we were trying to raise the alarm about about that particular line of work, that work focus going on that is now, as you see everywhere, you see those little rainbow circles that yeah. signify the, the, the goals of, of the SDGs everywhere. Mm. It's all mainstream throughout the whole system. You know, everybody's talking about that in, in all the programmatic work. And um, so 
you know, how, how big has that become? And so, yeah, that the foresight, um, you know, definitely goes to the, to the organizations who, who saw that and we, you know, had the honor of representing them uh, during that process. And, uh, but yeah, but, so down to the personal level, though, uh, at times, you know, it did feel like a little bit uh, overwhelming, mm. you know, to try to make sure that we got to all these meetings and, and sub meetings and meeting with friends groups and not all of them were friendly and they were friendly in one situation, but not friendly in another situation. And, and uh, so this is all this is all part of the process. But, um, yes, we had some some good folks and then. Uh, after Grace, uh, Joanne Carling came in, and, and and then you know you yourself came in and, and uh, lended support to the process, and, and Danica Littlechild at, at the very end there, in those last days, mm. and uh, you know where we actually achieved some recognition in there, not as much as, as what we liked. I mean, we went up and down through that process where we had this many mentions, and then it went down to these many mentions, and then we were like, hey, wait, and then we were back up into this many mentions, and then you know finally. We have what we have in, in, in the outcome document, but yeah, it was the same time that that we were we were engaged also in the in the world conference. But again, this is this is why you need people to be in you know if, why we need people <laughs> right? to be engaged and, and we need support. You know, at, at these times, you know, Ghazali, you saw with with the influx of the funding that that happened. We were able to get indigenous peoples were able to participate in the world conference we had those pre-meetings mm -hmm. you know i went to a pre-meeting in, in latin america in guatemala then we had the pre-meeting in alta that that you know we all know what happened there <laughs> and uh, so mm -hmm. um you know but there was funding that that assisted us to get because you imagine if, if we were back in the earlier days when everybody had to raise funds yeah on their own to go and, and there was very slim opportunities mm -hmm. For Taino, forget it. You know, they don't know what we are. You know, you're Latino or you're indigenous, but you're not recognized by the U.S., especially Puerto Rico, but you have the colonial relationship. You know, like, right. we had no doors open to us. And, um, you know, so it was a lot of, you know, bake sales and community, whatever, you know, to get <laughs> to get that, you know, to get and be a part of it. But, um, you know, you see what difference when the resources are allocated and, and, and shifted over to indigenous peoples. And that's, you know, what we're saying, like, there's, there's money out there. How they make all this money? You know, where did it, where did it come from? You yeah. Know, the, people can argue that, you know, like I hear this sometimes when I go out and talk, and, you know, you talk about responsibilities and, and, you know, what obligations people have, you know, based on colonialism and, and you know, social justice and then folks were like well, my ancestors came after you know we weren't involved in that we weren't you know we were pilgrims that came after but you know like so they tried to absolve themselves from the conversation yeah and you know but what i say is that yeah but we're all benefiting from that system that, mm -hmm. is that system put in place and you actually have levels of, of privilege you know and, and i'll say that in, in, in a way that you know, it's not available to, to us as, you know, people of color. Yeah. Or it, it's very slim. You know, that's why, you know, it's the importance of allies and, and, and people doing the, you know, the, doing the right thing for people on the planet, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, when we talk about equity and, and this and that, and, and really it, it, it's to the best interests of all that indigenous peoples are funded because, as I mentioned, you know, where are all these resources left in, in, in many cases? There's a lot right. of research now going in to show that that's really the case. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and we've heard this very early on. There was an early um, study by the World Bank. When I say early, I'm talking about, you know, what, what maybe the you know, the 90s and 2000s, mm -hmm. you know. There was right. an early study by the, by the World Bank that, that talked about the resources and biodiversity. Uh, uh, you know, 80% of the world's biodiversity remains on indigenous people's lands and territory. Sure, yeah. And so, you know, now, you know, that's been expanded to other, you know, to other uh, statistics, right, to show this relationship and that, you know, if we're guarding this and, and in guardianship of these territories that really affect, you know, the world, right, in, in mm -hmm. food, you know, food sources, quality of air, uh, you know, the, what we need to to continue on into the future as, as a human race, then, you know, it's important that people support indigenous people's issues. And that means like a lot of these funding agencies, but you know, I think we're seeing a shift now 
that's where these funding agencies are now starting to uh, give directly to indigenous organizations, not through other parties. Mm -hmm. We're now we're even seeing some funding mechanisms that are led by indigenous peoples, which certainly wasn't heard of, you know, back when in, in those early '90s. You know, we right. weren't talking about that uh, too much at all. And so that that's expanded the opportunity for more folks to be involved. Yeah. What is you, you? You were working for so long at SDGs. Um, you doing a lot of work for, for still for the um, United Confederation of Taino people, for the Taino people in general. Um, Traveling Foundation. You also take that on board as well. What is um, the juice that keeps you going? Well. It's certainly not the financial aspect of no, it. No, definitely not. <laughs> but uh, no, honestly, it, it, it's, uh, I mean, I, I had a, a, a strong, I was really motivated early on when, in mm -hmm. those days that I told you how it started, you know, that, that I really felt that this was important, this was important to be involved with, to be, to make a contribution somehow, to be of service mm -hmm. in a way. And uh, it took me away from like my previous thinking of what, where I thought I was going to be, you know, at, at that time where it was more about me and, and you know, what success would be and, and you know, how I could attain that mm. success. And it, it really took me into like going back into myself and, and getting back in touch with, you know, community and land. And so the juice that keeps me going now, you know, I, I had that passion uh, in the beginning, you know, to really uh, this this kind of self awareness and and, and and that build up and that decolonization of, of my own mind, mm. but, you know, at a certain point, you know, for me, um, you know, I also have a family, right, <laughs> and uh, I want to be able to look at, at you know my kids and, and other kids in, in that I know and that have grown up with me in this in this movement and you know through cultural presentations, Taino culture presentations, the kids that have families, like, you know, we want to see a future for them and, and, and to leave them something. I'd like to leave them a little bit more than, you know, knowledge wise than, than what I had available to me that, you know, so they don't have to go, you know, digging as much as we did and mm. going through as much, but, you know, everybody has their struggles, you know, so, so that's part of, part of it. But, um, you know, now it's, it's also, you know, we want to see something for the future generations. I mean, it's, it's not only about us. Like this life is not only about us. It can be. Certainly mm -hmm. people who become quite monetarily successful with yeah. thinking, you know. But if we go back and to what those instructions were from, from our own peoples, is that what they're telling us? Mm -hmm. you know, are we really listening to what they're telling us? And I like to think that, you know, being a part of this and, and again, being of service in, in this way, you know, that, that I am listening to them, you know, maybe I don't understand everything yet, uh, but, you know, I try and uh, I'd like my kids to know that I try right. to make a better, to make the world a better place for their community, a better place to give you know, a good, a decent life. That's not just based on you know, the level of wealth, the kind of car you drive or, or or this, but that there, there could be a real sense of, of, of the appreciation of life, you know, mm -hmm. and to walk around with respect, you know, as, as, as best you can, you know, for people and, and, and others and, and even other other thoughts, you know, other ways of thinking about things. You know, I, I, I try not to, to let that historical perspective affect my relationships with people, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie and say that I don't think about things, you know, like, you know, was, I'll give you an example. I, I, the first time I went to Spain, I, I, when I was younger, I thought I was never wanted to go to Spain. You know, like, why would I want to go there? What do those people did to my ancestors? You know? mm. But then, you know, I kind of got over that and saw it, you know, it was necessary to do what I was doing in that moment. And I had to go. And when I did it, I, you know, there was some things for me to learn there, you know, and yeah. there's experiences that, that were important for me and that just that letting go of that, um, 
you know, was important for me in, in that, in that moment. So, you know, uh, that's, that's that. That's, is it some place that I want to go to every year? No. I mean, I have, a, there's many other places that I, I like to go to, but I did it and I went and, you know, we, we move on. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's not because I have a hatred for, for them, you know, I have other things to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, at least that burden in, in, in that way was kind of lifted in, in, at some level, you know, but, um, yeah. <laughs> the, and what I wonder then is so far there's, you've, you've, you've seen a lot, you heard a lot, experienced a lot. Um, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned in, in the last yeah, in, in the work or maybe life lessons, maybe. Well, I'm still learning, brother, you know, I mean, uh, right. Some things I, uh, but I have to say, you know, going back and listening to what they had to say, meaning they, our ancestors had to say, and really, un, you know, working to understand that and articulate that in, in our present situation. You know, mm -hmm. that to me is, is an important, are important lessons. And I still learn, you know, as, as I, you know, we work with the language and we see how really the concepts that are involved in, in these words, you know, what builds words and, and language. And, you know, sometimes it's not the spoken parts, but the unspoken parts that are also important in, in the language and, and mm. you know, how you connect these things. So, you know, all of that, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, that one really impactful statement from uh from russell means that you know decolonizing our minds you know that right. that's, that's a lesson learned and, and i think that's applicable you know for for all you know and uh you know this idea of um, humans making things more complicated than they need to be again, mm. back to the teachings and, and that this you know that's there's there's a lot of good lessons out there you know <laughs> but we have to be humble enough to accept them right and I think, uh, you know, that's that's probably the, the underlying is that we 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 use a term now uh, in the Taino language we say Oma Bahari, that's like with respect, mm. right? and so having that respect, right, that underlying foundation of respect, is really, you know, what I've come to see as as important in in, in everything that we do whether we're talking about respect for the earth, you know, respect for each other, respect for all the different manifestations of human being, you know, so if that's male, mm -hmm. you know, female, non-binary, what, 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 what have you, that, that level of respect for people and planet and, and things is, is probably, you know, the underlying foundation there of, of, of interaction of, and of diplomacy, of, of Taino diplomacy. You know how how you try to move forward. You know, and it's not that you know you want to let other people. Uh, when I say that, it, it's not something where you let people kind of walk over you. Mm. So you want to be strong in what you're saying and, and what your position is, but there's a way that you can say it to people. You know, which is you know like for example, you know. I used to curse a lot, you know, <laughs> when I was young, like, and, you know, every once in a while, you know, I still click back into that, you know, right. and, and use those words, but is it really necessary? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I don't know if it is, there's some, I read something about it that says people who do that are like more intelligent or, or they're expressing creative. I, I, I don't know. Something I read, I, I thought it was funny, mm. like interesting and, and funny in an interesting way, you know, but, um, you know that 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 the level of aggression all the time. You know, like like we don't need to always be aggressive. You know, in, in our like we can respect other people even when we don't agree with them. We can find a way. You know, instead of like, you know, you are this and that, stupid because you don't you know mm -hmm. see it my way. Like, you know, maybe it's like, well, that's an you know that's some way to think about it. But you know, this is the way we would see it as you know my people we would you know give them something to think about you know that maybe tones down a situation more than 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 there needs to be aggression i think that that's another way it's not to say that 
you know, you shouldn't, you know, like my whole family, we're, we're recently enrolled in, in martial arts classes to make sure that we're, you know, physically, nice. you know, my, my, my daughters can defend themselves and, you know, there's not everybody thinks that that way, right? Mm. So it's, it's not that you're not prepared, but, you know, how are you going to conduct yourself, you know, and, and you know, am I going to, you know, try to find a way to work it out or just, you know, throw you to the side of what was that relationship worth, you know? Right. Uh, is it worth just letting go or, or do we find a way to, to continue? And, you know, that, that basic, you know, macro level type of interaction, you apply that to the, to the larger level. It's not idealistic. Uh, in my view, to say that, mm -hmm. uh, because you know these are the instructions. These are what what got our communities by, you know, in, in in those times all the way up to that point of of, you know, encounter with 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 that that really aggressive mentality that that you were talking about, and, and which is why you know I'm perfectly fine interacting with the world and in, in, in the spirituality of of what I feel is. is mm is linked to what my the way my ancestors uh, saw the world uh, i have no, i don't really have a need to to go beyond that i, I could certainly participate in ceremony with it with everybody you know if we're, if we're talking about good things and want good things you know I, I'll, i'm there no matter what religion it is i i can spend that time with you and, and be honored to do so but you know, as long as you don't try to convert me, you know, mm, <laughs> we've yeah. been through that already, you know, <laughs> some of our folks, you know, are still part of that. So, yeah. You know, and, I, and I don't want to just throw them out, you know, without finding ways that we can work with them too. But right. if the conversation, you know, has to be equitable, you know, I think that that's the other part. If, the, if there's that respect, then, it, then, then it's equitable because I don't want to talk to somebody, you know, if, and talk about spirituality and, and these type of things where at the end of the day, when I leave that conversation, that person's like, huh, yeah, that's nice, but they're still going to hell. You know, like that's not an equitable conversation. No. You know? Yeah. That's not, uh, that's not a respectful conversation in my view. Yeah. So, um, you know, that I'd like to see, you know, that, that's the way I think about things when, 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 as we're moving forward, you know, and, and if, and if we're good like that, we can respect each other and we don't always have to agree. That's, that's the other thing. It's like, uh, I learned later, um, you know, you don't always have to say yes to everything. And, and I said yes to a lot of things for a long time. And that was my own journey, you know, mm. um, but, you know, I've, I've learned to, that you can say that it's okay to say no to some things that there has to be, you know, times when you have to put the brakes on certain things and for your own sanity and for the, for the cohesion. If you have a family, you know, family cohesion and, and you need to do things like that and, you need to give time to your community, you know, you could be out there and you can really get caught up in, in this international work. And then, you know, how are you linking back to the community? When are you breaking bread with them? You know, when are you, yeah. you know, like uh, getting back down to the, you know, having coffee with somebody and, and talking about, you know, how their, their planting cycle went this year and, or, you know, what the fishing is like, you know, like you have to get back to that level too at, at times. Such a, um yeah many m yeah a lot of lessons definitely in there that i think not only resonated with me but also with i think with a lot, a lot of people as well that you can you, you can get this whole world of the un advocacy where it can be overwhelming and, and it can and, and it can be at some point burdening as well because because it, it's um it never ends Anyway, like if, if, if it's um, so you do need to have to have some kind of a I don't, I don't know I, I just for me I I recently developed this coping mechanism actually well like because uh, because the you do the one world is, is so slow and, and it's so big it's such a big monster and as indigenous people so we, we 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 have to be everywhere like you said you know like it is you can't go just to the print form on indigenous issues you have, to get, you, have to, you have to get to the SEGs. you have to go to climate change you have to go, you have to go everywhere but if you're the only one you know it, it can be super burdening and and it's um yeah you need to have some have a, not only have a support system but also like like it's have the, the know um connect them back with, with the community that, that's for sure and and also 
the um you know listening to stories and also the yeah and, and the ancestors and elders i think um in a way um i was yeah i, I think I was, I was like you said you you were there was a different you before right there were there was a a, a um like like a where ego had the, the bigger hand overhand of you and i think until 2014 um ego was lead, leading me as well 15 maybe that and ha has gotten me looking back at things um yeah like it had has if i wasn't so egocentric i would have been in a lot better state of mind position maybe um but i think that's that's the lesson right um and i think you can you can do anything you can you can turn back times but you know you can you can only take the lesson to heart and try to do better for yourself and people around you and you got kids amazing amazing kids you know and and so it's um um definitely the lessons that you want to um yeah others to, mistakes or a lesson that others want to learn from um it's yeah that's why i i um I, yeah you, you you're 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 like a brother to me I, I, I like working with you i like hanging out with you uh, talking and um and and you know and that's why i just wanted to sit it on, on public on record as well is that um if there's anyone that um i i'm glad that would was able able and willing to take over for 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 pamela uh, in terms of tribal link foundation it's i'm glad it's you um that because you know it, it is you've been with with pamela for a very long time work sorry working with pamela um uh, but um yeah it is um i don't know like losing pamela is, is, is still um as you can as you can hear is still a still a um um Still hasn't healed, I would say. The wound still hasn't healed yet. Still thinking, still thinking about her, friends. And I'm glad that you got to bury her in Skatiko First Nation uh, or, or spread her her ashes. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and um, yet, I've I got one question for you though. And what is the what is it that you really want to achieve in your lifetime? What's the what's the utopian view, maybe? <laughs> the utopian view. I like to see our, our, our people really living the self determination that they have the right to. <laughs> uh, I think that that's that's uh, you know I don't know if that's a utopian view, but that's certainly what I'd like to see. You know, is that you know our people have you know, that opportunity to to engage in that in that basic human right of, of self-determination yeah um, you know that's i'd like to see you know our folks speaking the language again like like we're speaking this language now you know that's that's something that i'd like to see mm. um, and i'd like to see that continue into the future there's, there's a lot of um, knowledge in there you start poking around and, and looking into what what these things mean and as I said, um, it's unfortunate, you know, in part of history that they were not really listened to at that at that time. But you know, we can do our, our, our best to to listen to them and to you know really try to understand what they were saying. And, and you know, I again not trying to say that my folks were you know this or that or or, or put them on a you know, more romantic view than necessary, but there was a lot of good ideals that, that they had that I think that the world could benefit from, could have back then and, and could now, because <laughs> we still see that kind of consumptive monster, right? Just mm. up everything around us and not thinking about the future. Um, so I think that, that, yeah, so I'd like to see, you know, a world that 
you know, that could sustain our folks <laughs> right in, into the future generations so that they can also like drop that ego thing that's that's going on and uh, that they're the center of the universe and that you know all, all of that stuff but, you know that's part of the human condition now you know and uh you know that they find a way to sustain themselves within the the boundaries of, of what the planet has to offer you know we're not these are not infinite resources that we have here these are finite resources mm. if you really want to see you know a future you have to take that into consideration which is what you know, where now the buzzword sustainable and green economy and all the stuff that in a way indigenous peoples were already speaking about, mm. but, you know, they were not market driven, which is the problem where, where you, when you get into the UN is that a lot of these things are market driven and there, you know, there's GDP, there's, you know, all this financial stuff, their finances are in there, you know, and how access to resources increases, you know, jobs and, and the status and moving from quote unquote third world to first world, right? Mm. You know what I'm saying? There's a this hierarchy and, and and you know, these folks use all these resources. Like look at the first world countries who is using the most resources. Right. And not living sustainably, but you know, but that that's the goal. Mm. And so uh, you know, there has to be like a reshift, a paradigm shift as as people like to say now. Um you know, it's really just the way that you think about things and the way that you, that you see things and what is really important. You know, is it you, once again, as an individual? But, you know, being Indigenous is not an in individual exercise. It's a communal exercise, right? Mm. And it's about peoples. That was the whole point of, of you know, the international law that also recognized collectives. Mm. Right? It's not just about us. It's also about the peoples, right? right. You know, there's certainly, you know, when you're talking about harm and self yes there's that your individual rights but when you're talking about collective rights and responsibilities you know now you're talking a language that indigenous peoples who, who are named indigenous peoples now can understand you know yeah it's we're and we're as we're um because I'm, I'm trying to um, yeah, digest everything that you said and um, not trying to I am digesting that, everything that you said sorry I'm not trying I am doing it actually I'm not an idiot I'm a jagged, I'm a jagged little pill huh? <laughs> um, is there anything that when, you, when it comes because you, you've seen the work you, you, you've done the miles um, within the indigenous movement on indigenous advocacy um is there anything that maybe on the SDGs, maybe on climate change, that you're like, ah, I wish we would have done, would have, we would have done that differently? I mean, there's always going to be that, right? I, mm. you know, do you achieve everything that you want? You know, like, like yeah, there was a big discussion when we were involved in, in the climate change and, and those negotiations, uh, stakeholder negotiations in, in 2015 and, you know, when, when we were going to Paris and, and that. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a way that certain people contextualized what was going on. And what I mean by that is that, you know, before we went to Paris, indigenous peoples had meetings, you know, and at least, uh, you know, in the, remember at, at that time I'm, I'm working with, you know, in that, portfolio for for international indian treaty council mm -hmm. and so uh there was consultations that went on uh with indigenous peoples in, in the u.s and canada and i was a part of those and um you know so we went to uh, paris with a certain goal with three certain goals and um you know if you talk to some people who were part of that delegation we achieved getting those goals on, on the board right? mm -hmm. where they were placed on the board you know uh, how you interpret that is is the other side of the conversation you know so right. for example some folks wanted uh, the mention of indigenous people's rights in the textual you know article portion but it was in the preamble yeah and uh some folks saw that and especially a lot of the folks who were involved in the you know we had an inside 
in an outside, outside country, yeah for for Paris mm -hmm. and just can't do one thing a certain num a number of us were um, tasked with in the negotiations process and, and and being part of that language you know the, in the document others were raising the visibility of specific issues and the impacts of climate change on our diverse communities around the world mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of street protest there was a lot of um, there was a lot of campaigns made to raise that kind of visibility uh, you know sometimes it, it almost made it seem to some and someone was portrayed that you know, the outside strategy was somehow more legitimate or more um you know more uh, in, meaningful than what we were doing on the inside i, I don't agree with that mm. i think that both both of the strategies were, were important but i i did hear that you know that you know from some people who, who were involved in that process and i didn't agree with it then i still don't agree with it mm. but um you know and so when we did get that mention of rights in the preamble you know some of those folks were like ah oh, you see they're not really respecting we didn't get what we um, but you know it was in the document there's a mention and if you look at international law and i learned this from chief Wilton little child that you know if you look at the way international law is and, and the preambular text is supposed to set the tone for how the rest of the document is supposed to be interpreted yes. so you know legitimately it's it's important for it to be mentioned there because mm -hmm. then the rest of the text is supposed to be you know viewed in that context and in that in that moment under the context of of rights of the rights right. of indigenous peoples and so you know we felt that you know we did achieve is to a certain extent what we set out for you know right. mm -hmm. knowing again that you know the the, the paris <laughs> agreement was not going to solve all the problems i mean you know i think you have to be a little bit either I, I don't know if it's naive or or not being honest you know if you're if you were presenting paris as that as that kind of goal right where, right you know, the silver bullet you know like, yeah, going to solve bullet, everything you know? yeah and uh so you know when when you say like what you know the regrets you know i think more of my regret in international work is the divide and conquer strategies that the other side uses you know and that sometimes our people can't see beyond you know what's on the table to see that what else is in play which is mm -hmm. why certain things happen in a certain way where they kind of silo us or, or play somebody against each other and you know again it's not something that you know under the con human condition that other things that other people don't experience but you know as indigenous peoples right you know there we have something else going on so it's you know it's like um are we there yet to you know uh all of us in in those rooms certainly some people are <laughs> you know and i've seen and worked with them and had the honor to you know call them like you said brothers mentors you know mm -hmm. want to describe it sisters aunties you know grandmas grandpas you know I, i've seen where that ideal can really where people hold on to that ideal but I, i've also seen you know the other side to that where you know it, you know it was the good of the many really taken into consideration mm -hmm. <laughs> in 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 that final you know thrust there or you know what sometimes you know, you, you you can't get everything that you want in these negotiations, right? You're you're dealing with these entities that are oppressing our peoples. <laughs> I mean, this, Definitely. How do we describe it? There's you know, these are the same entities, which is why so many people question why we're even in the room in the first place. Mm -hmm. I've already told you why I feel that we, we should be there. Um, you know, and others obviously agree with that because they're there, right? Yeah. So um, you know, but not everybody will. I think that that's probably the, the, the biggest regret where, you know, something that could be so simple, you know, because of these kind of, you know, it happens like, look, you know, you look at the funding mechanisms, you look at what's going on. We call so long for there to be equitable funding for indigenous people. Finally, we're getting, you know, assistance to travel, to be part of meetings and then, you know, to, to lead funds. 
but you know, is this, you know, is it an equitable process there? You know, mm -hmm. are people, you know, are we using that to the, to the best of our way or, 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 you know, or is this further siloing people? Those are the questions we have to, to ask, you know, are we, you know, building up some and, and not all and, or, you know, these are questions we have just, I think there's, a, there's this constant point of self-evaluation uh, that you have as a person involved in, in this, uh, in this sort of work, but there's also a collective evaluation, you know, that, that needs to occur. And I, I don't know if that happens enough, you know, mm. uh, in, in our, in our movement, right. Uh, you know, rather than just some hard feelings, you know, at the end of the day, right. You know, but do we really evaluate this in, in, a, in a way that, you know, we could learn something from it, as, as you said, like you're listening and we're learning and that, you know, but we can learn, or you can learn about this, you know, to be better the next time or, or to show, you know, others that there was possibly another way, you know, as we're bringing in young people into this, to this, um, to this type of work. And I certainly don't want to discourage any, anybody from, from being into this, but this could be a very thankless uh, pursuit at, at times. Don't get me wrong. I've seen some of the most beautiful things and I've been blessed to see incredible and have incredible experiences but it could also be very hard on, on you as an individual mm. and where you can, you know, because of these, you know, this, this, this thing that I was just talking about, you know, this dynamic that sometimes occurs, you know, you can be placed in, in a position where you become, you know, the, the focus of not good things either, mm. <laughs> you, know, you know, attacks and, and attacks on like other public figures and attacks on you as a person, on your integrity. And, and, uh, you know, I can, you know, I have plenty of stories in, in that and, and that I have gone through and continue to go through Yeah, where, you know, people uh, try to, to do that. And you wonder where it comes from, you know, where a lot of these things, if, if you know about U.S. history, you know about the Cointel Pro program where you know, there was infiltration by the government to break down movements. They plant people into movements and, and these people start things and, and start a series of, of, of some, they put things in motion that, you know, is for the detriment of the movement as a whole, hmm. right? and and uh, you know, to to um, like like I brought up in the beginning, how they kind of um, lowered the estimation of the traditional leadership by placing some families in in a kind of foreman position, right? You know, like they they do these type of things. It's 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 fine crafted, you know, over five hundred years, right? You know, we right, to, yeah. To, to how they can manipulate situations and do that so some people find themselves in, in you know the 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 focus of of these campaigns and, and so the, and at that at those times there could be it could be thankless and hard and and brutal uh, on your on yourself you know and that filters over to family and, and to community you know so you have to be prepared for that and i think that the only way for me, you know, that I've been able to weather that as, as you know, you, you brought up before, but I'll reemphasize this is my connection to the spirituality, the ceremony, just even having a time to ground yourself, you know, with the things that you love or people that you love or, or you know, doing what you love, you know, some sort of, of happiness, because we also have to live this life too, you know, we also have to try to, to see what what's you know what is what are we fighting for you know there's there's a lot of beauty in this world you know besides the you know this this ugliness that that's going on and, and this this craziness that we've seen in the last few years you know mm -hmm. this rise of you know where we gotten so far right in in our in our wall and so many doors were opened especially in in our in our work but we've had but yet all of a sudden you know you see this backlash and and you know what this with this work, a lot of it is based on political will, right? So one year, that country could be on your side. Next year, they have another group of people that they voted in, and they're not on your side anymore, you know? Right. And so you have to be prepared for that, you know, like, oh, God, what do we do? You know, holy smokes, you know? Um, so you, know, you have to be prepared for those up and downs and for that kind of, you know, like we're in this for the long haul. But what you see is, you know, you mentioned utopian. I, I might not be there to see all the, you know, the fruits of the labor, right? Right. But so, you know, the people who came before me, a lot of them didn't see the fruits of the labor. They were, 
they didn't even get to see the the declaration being passed. You know, and you can imagine Chief Descaje and 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 those others who started at the League of Nations, right? What they wanted to see for their communities, and you know, they probably would think that a lot's gotten accomplished. But then and again, you know, with the rise of, of nationalism and right wing and and this 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 backlash to, to social justice, you know. It, it, you wonder what they were going to say, what they would say at, at this point about some of these things. Like some, right. some stuff hasn't changed, you know, <laughs> at all. But um, I, I think we have. I think that uh, there's been a lot of change, and, and I have a, I try to keep a positive view overall. Uh, but I, but I tell you, if it, if it wasn't for those ceremonies, if it wasn't for meeting, you know, all those good people with good ideas and, and, you know, that they could show you that, you know, there's another way possible, you know, mm. there's another way to act, you know, you don't have to just be a jerk, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that all that stuff sustains, sustains me and, you know, hopefully it sustains others to, you know, to continue in this, but yeah, you have to, you know, we didn't talk about this a lot in the early days of, of taking that time for yourself or, or, or that, but, I, I always used to run around, uh, kind of end it with this. I say, um, th these guys, uh, you know, I try to be slick about this and, and say, you know, say, no, you know, you're doing a lot of work here. You're doing a lot of work there. And, and you know, don't you ever sleep? And I was like, eh, there's enough time to sleep when you're dead. You know? <laughs> that, that was my, that was my answer. You know, I say the exact same thing. Then one day I was sitting with some elders and, uh, I try to be slick and, 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 you know, cheeky about it and say, ah, you know, there's enough time to rest when I'm dead. And that one elder turned around to me and said, what makes you think they're going to let you rest when you're dead? <laughs> that, blew, that blew my mind. You know? <laughs> Just shot me down. You know, there went the ego, you know, in that moment, mm. you know, right. Blew my whole worldview. And I was like, wow. You know, and then you think about how people call on their ancestors and elders. To, and you think, wow, you know, there's a lot of work to do, you know? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Never thought about that. Because I, use it. I use, use it. I use it too. Yourself, you know? Yeah. I use it too. Like, I'll, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Yeah. But this, this is an eye opener. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't work anymore. No, shoot. <laughs> I'm Roberto... sorry, man. I'm oh, sorry man. You, but I'm just sharing the wealth, you know? Thank you so much. You know, it, it's an, another lesson learned. And in, 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 we've been talking for three hours. You know, it, yes. it's it's such an amazing thing. Um, Roberto, fi final thing. If, if people want to reach out to you, um, like how can they talk to you? How can, how can they reach you? Yeah, you can get me through the, the social platforms, Instagram, Twitter. Um, Facebook, you know, in, in right. way, I have I have a website you can connect with and learn a little bit more about what I do or, or connect with me on something if, if you feel that you want to follow up on something or work together on something and you know, so let's see if it could happen. Have you thought about doing a podcast? I think you should. No, I, I used to do a radio show years ago. Uh, That's different. In New York City. But uh, I was just talking about... I talking about this earlier when uh, I mentioned to I was talking to my wife Jocelyn about uh, about coming on your podcast and then she's like hmm you know did, did something you know like have you ever thought about that and and, and uh, you know, it's like the radio you know it's yeah I think about it I don't know if I have time to do these type of things but it'd be great I used to love to interview people like what you're doing on that, and I uh, and I, I mentioned to her that I have a lot of tapes from interviews that I need to see if they still are functional, that they can be transferred over to digital, and uh, so that's like another project of mine that I, that I hope I hope that some of them are still in good condition to to actually do that. There's yeah. a lot of good interviews that happened over that time, right before 2000, um, or right around 2000. Uh, but yeah, so it'd be interesting, uh, you know. I think you should. I think you, you have. You have... Uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll do what the late night host does, and you can get me as a sub for your podcast one day when you're on vacation. <laughs> well, it, it, like it's it's not like uh, like uh, like interviews and all that, but just yeah, having these. Well, if you talk about late night, your your late night radio DJ FM sounds <laughs> like voice. 
and, and talking about stories and everything else. I think that that's, that you doesn't have to be an interview, but just you talking. I think that can be interesting enough. And you, right? that's the difference with podcasts. That it's more is that is that the difference? It, you can do it in many different ways. You know, I I, I mine is is different. It, it, I do interviews, but also record like I record myself and thoughts and everything else, and I upload that to the podcast as well. It is just online archive. That is how I do it. And that's how I think about it. This, this is me learning in public. This is me having conversation in public. It's not just, hey, I want to interview Roberto. I just want to learn from Roberto. And I'd love to talk to you because we're friends. Um, and I just do, do it in public, record it, and so that other people can listen with me and learn with me. Um, I think, and I think what you, what you just shared in the last three hours, I think there's a lot of wealth in there. Also, the, the the Taino. A lot of people think that Taino the Taino are extinct. Like they, they, there's there's you're not you're not there anymore. I remember I was in one Airbnb once, talking about Indian people. Oh yeah, and we're from Puerto Rico. You know, they they uh they, these these people they, they were hosting me and they, yeah, one was lady was from Puerto Rico and she said yeah we were that yeah, we had we had indigenous peoples they were called the taino and i'm like what do you mean had like i just spoke to one of you these people like yesterday which was you or ty either one of you and she was like amazed like what do you mean it's still there yeah they're still there so um definitely um I, if you want to start up I'll, I'll, I'll help you out definitely because i think there's 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 a lot of um and by the way it can be monetized <laughs> Two, you know, um, there's this, yeah, no, it, it is, you know, why not? You know, it is this, I'm suffering away from this imposter syndrome and then, uh, in terms of getting the, the subscribers to the podcast. I'm doing this for free and everything else, but there's also this, 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 this yeah, this part of it that can be monetized. So um, you can do that, do that as well, but think about it, you know? Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, take it on advice, man. <laughs> Friendly advice from Thank you my, so much. Yeah. I, I, I love you, man. I love talking to you. Love you, man. Always. Uh, you know, big hugs and, and all that. And, uh, you know, until we'll, we'll be talking again soon with other things. But uh, thank yeah. you. thanks for, for listening. And, and uh, I appreciate the, the time and hope, you know, some people. They will. They do. Some utility yeah. in it. <laughs> no, appreciate it. Thank you for doing this, man. And have a con great continuation of your day. You too. All right.